Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. Eric, what's going on, man? How are you? Things are wonderful here in a land of 10,000 lakes. Indeed, I am back, well, kind of my roots, back in Minnesota, visiting my brother and sister and having a little bit of a celebration, enjoying the hell out of it. I love the, uh, the new locale too. It's fun to see, uh, the background there or where in Minnesota are you? Are you from like specifically where, what town were you from in Minnesota? We live, I'm, I'm actually in the same parents or same house that my parents bought here back in 1970. It's in uh, an area called Lake Minnetonka. It's about 15 miles, 18 miles West of Minneapolis, directly West. And yeah, it's a nice area. Nice area indeed. So that was the house that your parents bought. 50 some odd years ago? It was back in 1970. So whatever that was. Yeah. A minute 54 ago. Four years ago. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, I'm, that's I moved into this. I came here. I stepped into the, this house when I was 14, actually, is uh, how old I was when we moved into this house. So it's, it's fun coming back. It's strange in a lot of ways, but it's fun. Man, how about that? Well, listen, we got a lot to talk about this week. We are excited that you were with us here at 83weeks.com. If you haven't already, we want you to head to our YouTube right now, 83weeks.com. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notifications bell. And we've got some exclusive new membership features. That's right. We've got a membership option we're rolling out at 83weeks.com. We're going to be going live before and uh, after the, the uh, WrestleMania show. And we're going to have a lot of fun uh, talking about that. We're also going to be covering uh, in sort of a, uh, a post match way the go home Rawls and SmackDown. So we've got a lot of really fun plans ahead for 83 weeks.com. We hope you'll join us. And I want to remind you that when we're live on 83 weeks.com, it's interactive. You get to ask questions to Eric Bischoff. And we're going to do that sort of as a sample, if you will today, because we're doing ask Eric anything. There's been so much going on in recent weeks. We thought, you know what? Rather than just me ask the questions, why don't we let you guys ask the questions? And joining us this morning, we've got a live studio audience with our friends from adfreeshows.com. Want to give a good morning hello to Bobby and George and Coach Rosie and so many other folks who were hanging out. Shout out to Mike Coop and certainly appreciate everybody stopping by on a Sunday morning like Coach Keith and hanging out with us. You can be a part of our live studio audience at adfreeshows.com. And of course, always, uh, get that bonus content from each and every show every month. But Eric, before we, we jump into all the, the questions that we got from our listeners. And by the way, the easiest quite place to ask questions is over on YouTube, 83 weeks.com. We're scrolling the comments now for questions. We didn't do that years ago. We do now. So ask us over at 83 weeks.com. Eric, this has been a, a crazy week, man. The rock was back in Memphis doing a big time promo. Dave Meltzer said, wow, tickets really moved in Memphis. Once they announced the rock was back, he did a little bit of a rock concert talking about Cody's mama. The whole crowd started chanting, whoop that trick, which was, uh, from that movie hustle and flow shout out to those guys. And, uh, then earlier in the week, two days prior to that, we had AEW big business. Mercedes Monet made her big debut. Finally. With AEW, we saw her pull up in the back in a, in a Maybach, and then we saw her in-ring appearance, big promo, little dancing, and then we closed with something we'd never seen before. Not just a ladies match, but I think it was Willow Nightingale's first main event. And I got to be honest, those ladies absolutely tore it up in the main event, but it didn't really tear it up in the ratings. Now, of course we did see Sasha, I'm sorry, Mercedes come back out in a new outfit and the whole deal. And there was a big overrun, but of course, when the report came out, everybody says, oh, well, the overrun, we don't have the numbers yet. And I just couldn't help, but wonder, man, what's Eric think about this? Was there a better way to structure the show to let people know that Mercedes was going to be there at the end because it doesn't feel that way. I mean, her, I think her segment was one of the higher rated segments. But when she comes out at the end, nobody knew she was coming. Nobody expected it. Maybe they should have, but should we have done a better job or what could we have done differently, Eric? 
The answer is yes. It could have been done differently. It could have, formatting the show is one of Tony's consistent problems. I've talked about it a lot, but I think this past week is an example, and it, it, we've seen it e even recently before this week, this past week. We saw it with Okada. We saw it with Osprey. They was they just popped up in the middle of the show. I mean, yes, there was some commentary, there was some narrative from the play-by-play -play and color team earlier on, but it there's no build. There's no there's no, nothing is done within the format to create anticipation to hold the audience with an expectation of something exciting happening. That's how you format a show. Your show throughout your one hour or two hours, or in the case of Raw, three hours, ideally, and it's really hard, I don't even want to talk about a three-hour show because that's almost impossible to, to, to be real successful formatting a three-hour show. But even with a two-hour show, the idea is to, first of all, in, in, in a best-case situation, you want to build on your lead-in. So if you've got a million viewers leading into your show, what is the show that uh, comes on before Dynamite? It's like Big Bang Theory or some yeah, shit. Yeah, that sounds all right. Yeah, Big Bang and Theory. And it's a very successful show that does does great numbers. Well, in an ideal world, you'll take that million, those million viewers or 900,000 or whatever the number is, doesn't matter. And you'll build upon it throughout your one hour or two hours of your show. That's what traditionally program executives strive for part of that is laying the groundwork if you know something is going to happen in the main event something that you want the viewers to stick around and watch you're building to it then you have to kind of lay some groundwork throughout the show two or three times in a in a in a, in a two-hour show would be adequate would not be overkill. And that can be 15 or 20 second bumpers, sound bites, perhaps an angle. There's a million different ways one could, could achieve it. But you have to plant some Easter eggs, so to speak, throughout that two hours to hold on to that audience in anticipation of whatever it is that you are building towards. Failure to do so results in dismal ratings. Again, Osprey, Okada from the week before. That, I mean, supposedly Tony Khan spent four and a half million dollars a year to get Okada. And look at the numbers. Look at the audience. They did not respond. Now, part of that is, I think, because Okada is, I know the, the Kool-Aid drinking AEW snaggletooth hardcore fans are going to, you know, rebel at what I'm about to say, but it doesn't mean it's not right. Okada is, no one knows him outside of the hardest of hardcore wrestling fans, the internet wrestling community, those who worship the ground Dave Meltzer walks on. Nobody knows who the fuck this guy is. So, and that's not a reflection on him. It's not his fault. He's been wrestling in an obscure wrestling promotion that no one watches, really. Um, it's incumbent upon Tony and AEW to build him up and to make him feel special. Same with Will Ospreay. They didn't do that week before. And as a result, I think the debut of both, now we've seen Osprey before, obviously, but he's now full-time on the roster. That should have been a cause for celebration. That should have been a big deal. There should be something that's done throughout the show to get us excited about that moment. And there wasn't. Nothing was done. Therefore, no one got excited, and the ratings reflected that. Same thing here with, with uh, Mercedes. I mean... 800,000 viewers on a show where you're bringing in, you know, arguably one of the more recognizable female stars in the wrestling industry who spent, I don't know how many years, a decade in a high profile position within the largest wrestling company in the world. And you bring her into AEW and you get 800,000 viewers. And I know, you know, Dave Meltzer immediately went, well, they didn't advertise her. That's why. Bullshit. Who are you kidding? 
you know, did, did, <laughs> If, if there was anybody who was a wrestling fan or a fan of AEW who didn't know that Mercedes Monet was going to make her debut in Boston, then I don't know what to tell you. If you if, if people like Dave want to believe that, there's nothing that I'm going to say that's going to change anything for them because they're stuck in this little, they're stuck in a rut, in a small way of thinking, and nothing is ever going to change for them. But the numbers don't lie. 800,000 viewers for Mercedes Monet. I don't know. And I know everybody's, oh, but wait till next week. Now that everybody knows, I got news for you, folks. If that number moves 3 to 5% either way, plus or minus, I'll be surprised. It's And I've said, I said it six months ago when the rumors or whatever it was, four months ago, when the rumors started floating around about Mercedes going to AEW. And the question was, oh, do you think it'll have any impact? My answer was, no, it won't. Just like no one else that's come from WWE has made an impact on the ratings. It's not the talent. The creative, there is no creative. In, there's no functional creative in AEW. I mean, basic television formatting, as we just got as we just finished discussing, doesn't exist. There's it's unbelievable. It's like a bunch of wrestling fans who've never produced five minutes of television got together and said, hey, let's put on a wrestling show. And they're entertaining themselves, I guess, but not the audience, with the exception of a, a, a nucleus of internet wrestling fans that just love AEW. I don't know, man. It's, it's really sad. I feel bad for the talent. I don't know Sasha Banks, Mercedes. I don't know her. I don't know that I've ever even had a syllable of conversation with her, but I feel bad for her. just like I feel bad for Will Ospreay and Okada and, you know, Christian Cage. And I mean, you look at the roster. Somebody posted a, a, an image on social media of all the WWE talent that is on the AEW roster now. I saw was, that. That was very WCW like, was it not? There was like 24. 25 top talents that that left WWE for whatever reason and are now in AEW. And it's like, what the hell? I don't think I don't know that at the peak of WCW's talent roster, as bloated as it ever became, I don't think we had that many former WWE talents on our roster. And we were delivering five and six and seven million viewers a week. I don't know. It's it's for all of the people that defend Tony, and, oh, he's just so smart. And, you know, Dave Meltzer thinks he's one of the most brilliant people in the world. Are you seeing it? Because I'm sure not. I'm, I am I just don't get it. I've got no dog in the hunt. I don't care. You know, I know there's some great talented people there. I know there's some people there that could help Tony. He doesn't need to go outside of the company. It's all right there at his fingertips. But for whatever reason, he chooses to keep doing things the way he's doing them. And clearly it's not working. You know, and I keep hearing about, oh, you know, the Warner Brothers Discovery, we've got this great relay. They love us. It's never been stronger. I hope that's true. Because if it's not, Tony's going to be looking for a place to hear that show. And I don't know. We'll see. I, I don't want to be negative. I, I'm trying not to be, but I'm also trying to be honest in my response and break it down so that it makes sense to people. And it's not just me spewing negative shit. But you have to learn how to format a show. You have to learn how to tell a story. And I mean a real story, not a wrestling angle story or, or one that like John Alba, when I talked to him and he has to, he's looking so deep at what's going on that he's creating a story in his mind to justify feeling good about what's going on. A compelling story is really easy to understand. If I go into a, an elevator with somebody that I know is a wrestling fan and I ask them, hey, what's the story between wrestler A and wrestler B? What, why, why are they in an angle? What happened? Usually within about two or three floors, someone can explain to you why, what, what the angle is. What's the backstory? I don't know that you can do that in, in AEW or for AEW without, you know, weed <laughs> or, or something to, to stimulate an imagination and provide you with some, some reasoning that doesn't really exist on television. 
Well, I, I got to disagree with you there. I mean, I, I do think there are stories. I know you, you don't watch every single minute of AEW, but I, and I'm not saying I do. I do wind up fast forwarding a few things here or there, but I, uh, by and large, know that there are stories in AEW, but I do know that that graphic got my attention over the weekend. Uh, I think Silva's got it pulled up for us. There's more than 40 talent who are former WWE talent in AEW, and I'm not exactly sure why someone made this. I guess Black Mask Designs deserves the credit. I see his signature at the bottom right. But, yeah, you know, like that, I guess, is supposed to be some sort of a knock against AEW. But to me, you know, if you're trying to put together a roster of what you believe to be the best team possible for your company, well, you're going to look to experienced professionals. And, well, we got more than 40 that are here. Now, now of course, not all of those guys are in front of the camera. I mean, you see faces on there like Jerry Lynn and, and Mark Henry and Taz and a lot of those guys are working in a backstage capacity or commentary, not just in ring performers, but, uh, yeah, the fact remains there's a bunch of, uh, moving parts in AEW right now. I think you're onto something with the introduction of Okada. I do believe that a lot of wrestling fans know who Okada is, but let's qualify a lot. How many yeah. people have been watching impact? How many people have been watching new Japan TV and how many people have just heard his name? And there is a difference. I mean, I don't know exactly how many people saw him in impact hundred thousand, 200,000. I'm not saying when he was Kato, I'm saying most recently. And then when new Japan was doing TV here in America, that was like a hundred thousand at best. So you do have a certain contingent, you know, we'll call it a hundred thousand. You got a solid hardcore hundred thousand fans who are all about them, some Okada and that's great. But now we've got to build to the mainstream. So I, I get what you're saying there. Like we've got, well, and, and, and kind of not to interrupt you, but to dig in on that just a little bit, you've got a hundred and this is, you know, this is the voodoo part of this. And none of us can ever really, you know, um, um, track or account for credibly, but we'll use the hundred thousand viewers from impact as an example, or New Japan, either one, because they're probably the same audience. The yes. same 100,000 people that are watching Impact are probably the same 100,000 people that are watching New Japan that are probably already watching AEW. Not a majority, but uh, but yes, there's probably a lot of crossover. I, I, I would imagine there's a lot more crossover than, than people think, simply yes. because those shows are targeted towards the hardest of hardcore, that segment of the audience that just are obsessed with professional wrestling and will watch anything that they can watch. And they want to be involved. They want to be able to talk about it. They want to be able to go online and, and share ideas or, or argue or debate or constructively criticize, whatever the case may be. That, that 100,000 the pool of a hundred thousand viewers that watch impact that watch new Japan are in my opinion, probably 80% of them are already watching AEW. So you're not getting any added value. It's not that I, I don't think it's realistic for someone to say, well, there, there's a hundred thousand viewers over here for impact. There's a hundred over here for new Japan. Well, that's 200,000 viewers that are fans of, of Okada. We should expect a bump in our show. We should expect a bump in our, our ratings. It doesn't work that way, folks. It's the same audience. So there's no added value. The only way you're going to get added value, now you do have a bigger audience in AEW, and your job as a pr producer, not as a booker, I'm not talking about traditional wrestling where bookers just write names down on paper and book them for live events. I'm talking about episodic television and the compelling story. And I think that's the difference. That's why I get into it with Alba on this a lot. Is there a story? Sure. Is it compelling? Absolutely not. If it was, the audience would be growing. If it was, AEW on some scale would be experiencing some of the same kind of energized viewing that we're seeing in WWE because the stories are compelling. Yes, there's a story, but if the story is so simple, undisciplined, doesn't build, doesn't track along traditional storytelling formula lines. It's just an excuse for a wrestling match. And there's a lot of excuses for wrestling matches in AEW, but there's very little, if any, compelling story. There's the difference. 
Well, I want to be clear too. It sounds like we're, uh, we're trying to pile on AEW. That is not the case. There is a difference between offering constructive criticism and being a hater. And, um, sometimes that gets lost in translation. And if you don't want that to happen in your real life, can we recommend Babel? You know, the best way to learn a new language is immersion, you know, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. That's how Silva learned English. But if that's not <laughs> in the cards this year, you can still learn a language the second best way. And that's with Babel. You know, one in five Americans have learned a new language on their bucket list. And if that's you, man, let's make 2024 the year that you finally check it off the list with Babel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed love language learning app that actually works. Yeah, don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real life situations and delivered with conversations based on technology. So you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. Maybe it's like ordering food or asking for directions or, Hey, where's the bathroom? Maybe you just want to figure out how to negotiate with some of the merchants when you're on a cruise, whatever, man. Studies from Yale, Michigan state and others have all proven that Babbel is just better. That's why I said you're going to love learning a new language with Babbel. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is like the equivalent of going a full semester at college. Babbel's the real deal, man, with over 16 million subscriptions sold, plus all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are all backed with a 20-day money-back guarantee. How do you beat that? And here's a very special limited-time deal for our listeners here at 83 Weeks. Right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash weeks. That's right. Get 50% off at babbel.com slash weeks. That's B-A-B-E-L.com slash weeks. Let's spell that one more time. Babbel is B-A-B-B-E-L.com slash weeks. Rules and restrictions may apply. Hey, Where Conrad, you, you, know, you want to know where uh, Babbel can really pay off, where it's paid off for me specifically? Okay. Japanese. I, I can learn just enough Japanese on Babbel to go to a sushi bar. Now, I'm talking about a traditional Japanese owned. Usually, I look for those. Those are my favorite, you know, a, a family owned Japanese restaurant. Sometimes they're in little strip malls. You got to look for them. You know, not the big, fancy, super expensive one where the celebrities go. Those are generally, I mean, they're very nice, but they're expensive. And I don't I don't look for those places. I'm looking for a little mom and pop, Japanese-owned family sushi bar. And when you find one of those diamonds in the rough and you sit at the sushi bar and you attempt. And, and with Babel, you could do it pretty effectively, fairly quickly. Just ordering in Japanese or saying good evening in Japanese or saying thank you properly in Japanese opens up a whole new world at a sushi bar because all of a sudden the sushi chef is asking you to, here, try this. He may not even speak English, but all of a sudden you're getting things that you didn't even order because you're making the effort. You're crossing that bridge between the cultures. And it's it's a way of being respectful. Really, that's how I always take it or, or, or think of it. And when you show that little bit of respect or encouragement to try to speak somebody else's language, it's pretty amazing what can happen. The dynamic changes. And when it's happening at a sushi bar and you're getting all kinds of great stuff, some of it not even on the menu, like they only keep it for themselves because they know you're really interested in their culture. It really can change the experience, whether you're out eating or on a cruise, like you say, or just you know traveling in a foreign country. Just making the attempt to, to speak in somebody else's language changes the dynamic of a lot of situations very quickly. Check it out, babble.com forward slash weeks. So Eric, we were talking a little bit about lost in translation. I didn't tell you this, but when I was visiting some of my pals and, uh, 
well, people that you and I are both friends with on the podcast side of things at AEW in Huntsville, I ran into a fellow who works, uh, we'll say in a backstage capacity, not someone who you and I know or speak to on a regular basis, but someone who went out of their way to come introduce themselves to me and say hello. And with no one listening, share, I try to apply a lot of what I learned from Eric Bischoff to what we do here. So I know that there's some people who listen to this show and when you're critical and, and I say, Hey, what could they have done better? A lot of people get, you know, under their tribalistic blankets and say, Oh, that's not fair. And here's why, and here's what you don't understand. It's not coming from a place of ha ha, you know, that, that kid in the Simpsons. No, it's coming from a place of, Hey man, I want this to work. I want this to be better. I want this to be bigger. I mean, that's really the spirit of all of your critiques and criticism, right? It truly is. I mean, if you think about it, what reason would I have to be critical or to be angry or to just, you know, tear them up, tear AEW apart. I have no dog in the hunt. You know, I, 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 I can't explain that any more clearly than that. I don't, Personally, I have no investment emotionally or otherwise with the exception of the fact that I want to see the business as a whole survive, grow, and prosper. The business as a whole, not just WWE, but I want to see AEW grow like I really thought it was going to in the very, very beginning, and I was very supportive of it. If you go back and listen to some of my commentary back then, if you go back and look at some of my social media posts back then, it was very, very positive. It's, and again, I don't want to beat up something we've already talked about, but but Tony Khan came out immediately and challenged WWE and started taking shots at WWE. And so did a lot of the talent. And some of them are my friends. I'm not going to name drop them here because it's, it's past. It's not going to change anything. But a lot of high-profile people, talent in the, in AEW, immediately came out and started making pretty bizarre predictions about what was going to happen in the competition between AEW and WWE. Tony himself, up until really recently, I think he's toned it down quite a bit over the last few months. I think it's finally dawned on him that it's the backlash from doing so isn't worth it. But there's just been so much cosplay competition between the two it was totally unnecessary and we talked about it last week had tony adopted the paul Heyman approach and embraced his role as an underdog and i know this is going to sound crazy especially coming from me but there were two different situations meaning i was going literally head to head in a real world way right and and tony's not and hasn't and won't so that is a big difference that people tend to want to forget about i guess but had Tony embraced his underdog status and actually put over WWE in, in, a, in a constructive, positive way, not gloat over them, but I mean, really acknowledging their growth and their success in almost an aspirational way, the amount of goodwill that he would have been able to cultivate, harness, and enjoy would have been phenomenal. And I really thought that's where he was going in the beginning. But he took another path, and that, you know, we're talking about the tribalism. You know, the large part of that is because of Tony and the talent at WWE. They started it. They created it. And now that they're on the receiving end, of course, anybody that says anything critical, constructive, or otherwise, you know, is being accused of, you know, being a hater. And that's certainly not the case with me. I want them to be successful. There's people there that I, I, I know pretty well. Um, and respect. There are people there that I don't know at all, but still respect. And I want them to be successful. I want the business that I spent 30 some odd years of my life in. I want it to prosper and continue to grow. Even if I'm not in it, I have no desire to be in the wrestling business again, especially in today's environment. Zero desire, zero desire to travel, zero desire to deal with the drama and the egos and the bullshit that I know is going on backstage in both companies. Right, I just don't want to do that. That's, yeah, I've been there. I've done it. I've been to the mountaintop really twice as a talent and as an executive. So for me to go back into a business, there has to be something really, really exciting about that that I haven't experienced before, and that's not there for me. And I'm really good with it. 
I'm so good with it, it's hard to articulate. But that doesn't mean that when I see things that are just fundamentally flawed, some of the just most basic things, like formatting a television show that seems to escape anybody in AEW, it boggles my fucking mind. And I'm going to say something. Doesn't mean I hate anybody. Quite contrary, really. Well, listen, I, the critics and the naysayers of you will say, oh, you're just like some of these other podcasters and your entire format of your show is just dumping on AEW and being critical. But the reality is when something's good on AEW, you acknowledge that. You, you highlight it. You celebrate that. I mean, the first collision you were very complimentary of. The Will Ospreay match you just saw in pay-per-view, you were very complimentary of. And I don't know. I just think some of there's a lot of bad faith takes, I think is the phrase everybody's using these days. And yeah, bad faith. The minute somebody says bad faith, I immediately dis dismiss them as worthless. Their 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 opinions, their commentary, their whatever it is. They lose all credit credibility when people constantly rely on these terms that are so prevalent in, in the tribalistic environment of social media, and bad faith is one of them. You know, here's the other one. This one drives me batshit. You don't hear it in wrestling so much, but anytime, especially with politicians, when they come out and say, we need to have a conversation, fuck you. You don't want a conversation. You want me to sit down, shut up and listen and agree to everything you want to say. That's what politicians describe as a conversation in, in today's environment. And it's the same thing with this bad faith bullshit. It's usually the people that use bad faith on a regular basis that are most guilty of bad faith. So there you go, boys and girls. Uh, if you want to have a conversation with Eric Bischoff, his response is fuck you. Uh, let's jump into the, question. if it starts off with bad faith. Yeah, <laughs> it will. Uh, sir. X a lot says, what does Bischoff think of the state of wrestling presently in the direction it's going? What would he identify as the good, the bad and the ugly? That's a fun question. Thank you very much, sir. X a lot. I mean, I think the state of the wrestling business is extremely strong. I don't, I don't know how anybody could deny that, you know, you can, I mean, it all comes down to revenue. That's the the ultimate measuring stick. How much revenue is being generated in the professional wrestling industry? I don't know that it's ever been as close as it to being as successful as it is today. So by that by that measure, it's hugely successful and continuing to grow, primarily because of WWE. And, and the inroads that they're making with sponsorships and, you know, with their premium live events and cities bidding. I'm here in Minneapolis. And one of the big news stories yesterday on local news is that Minneapolis is in the running for WrestleMania. And there's as much excitement about that here locally as there would be if the, if Super Bowl was coming, I mean, it was crazy. They were out interviewing people on the street. It was nuts. I was, I was proud. I was excited not because I have a dog in the hunt. I'm not there. I'm not going to be there. I don't want to be in WWE. I'm having fun being a fan. But to see that energy and, and amount of excitement for a, you know, premier, you know, wrestling event for sure, WrestleMania, the biggest of them all. But to see that is exciting. And to see that same thing happening in Perth, Australia, and in, 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 in France and other parts of the world, I don't know how you can be a wrestling fan, or in my case, somebody that spent 30 odd years in the business and not be really excited about that growth. Television is a different, you know, if you're going to use television ratings and the number of people that are watching television in the United States as your barometer, then you might have some issues. You might have a debate. You might have some questions. But if you just look at the revenue that's generated by the industry, and that's really all that matters because that revenue is generated in different ways. Some of it, obviously, by television. That's a big, big piece of the revenue puzzle, right? Television rights fees. But there's so many more aspects of it, and all of that is growing. I think the fact that Warner Brothers Discovery, you know, rolled the dice with AEW and was willing to give them an opportunity, and perhaps that opportunity will pay off. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, perhaps it'll pay off, but that's an exciting thing. There's there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about the wrestling business in general, regardless of how you feel about any one promotion. 
Uh, what that, that's that's how I feel about the general state. What's the good? Uh, I think I just covered the good is growing. What's the bad? Um, I don't know that there's any bad, you know, um, in, in terms of it hurting the business. Um, I, I think some of the extremes that some people try to go to to get themselves over in an environment that in the environment that we have today on television, I think that's pretty bad and can get ugly. I think the, can you the explain of, that? yeah, the blood. I, I think going to extremes of violence in lieu of art, and by art I mean the storytelling component, as we talked about earlier. I won't beat it up again. Quality, quality, disciplined, structured storytelling that's compelling and gets the audience into the program. That's the art of it. I think the art of telling that story in the ring is, is a big part of it. And I think sometimes there is a tendency by some people and the producers they work with to go to an extreme to, to try to get the attention, to try to get the awareness and that extreme is usually excessive amounts of violence and blood. And I don't think that that element of the product and the presentation of the product can make up for lack of story and lack of characters. So I think the reliance upon and the go-to for that kind of extreme, that extreme element of professional wrestling, that's always been there. Right. And I think in today's environment, it's bad. It's a bad choice because it ultimately will turn off Program directors, television networks, advertisers, and that's bad for business. But I think overall, we're we're in a pretty healthy state of affairs. I want to bring that up to you because, or I'm glad you brought that up uh, because there was a, a tweet that I saw. I wanted to mention that I saw over the weekend. There was a report somewhere, uh, and and if Silva can find it, we'll give him credit. But the gist is. That some folks behind the scenes in WWE are a little upset with The Rock. Apparently, Nick Khan and Paul uh, Hunter, Triple H, that's easier for me to remember, sent out some sort of a memo or gave a heads up to Talon or whatever the report was, because I don't have it right in front of me. But the gist was, hey, we're still trying to be PG, so uh, don't don't worry about what The Rock's doing on social media and what he says in his promos. Cause you and I sort of talked about that in the last few weeks, man, he made me laugh out loud when he said, now go home and smoke some more crack. I mean, it just got all over me. It's one of the funnier things I've ever heard in comedy. It would be called a callback. I loved it. And then he did some more sort of risque stuff on social media this week where he's dropping the F bomb and things like that. And then did a pretty risque for what it was a uh, little rock concert if you will in memphis and allegedly a lady flashed and they had to have the screen go black and it does feel like wwe is on a slippery slope there too but if the report is true that is not their intention rock is just doing what rock wants to do and well who can tell him no what do you make of that report not much because I don't know the details of it and I didn't see, I, I did read about everything you talked about, but I didn't see the, the incident. Um, I saw it online where in the middle of the concert, everything went black and I saw the narrative associated with it. Yeah. But you know, if you've got a guy like rock, who's obviously going to suck all the air out of the room, he's going to get the most attention of anybody on the roster, especially given the circumstances, you know, coming in and being a part of WrestleMania kind of, late in the game, so to speak, and all the attention that's on that story and everything. And just the fact that he's fucking rock, right? If, if rock has got latitude and the ability to do things creatively, but the rest of the roster can't, it's just hard to manage. You know, the rest of that roster are pros. I don't think anybody there feels like they need to go out there and be as graphic as rock has been and drop F bombs and things like that. I don't think anybody feels the absolute need to go out there to do that, to get themselves over. They've proven that to themselves already that they can get over without it, but it does create kind of a double standard. And I, my guess is that internally, a lot of people just know that and accept it for what it is. 
But if it continues, like if we see this go beyond WrestleMania and it becomes a consistent thing, eventually you're going to have some talent that are going to start fighting back and having some questions. And it'll, it'll create some issues down the road if it continues. Something, I don't know, maybe this is just because I want it to be true because I'm guilty of that sometimes. If I want something bad enough to be true, I will see it as true, even if it's not. It's human nature. But I'm hoping that we're going to get through WrestleMania and that aspect of what WWE is presenting will settle down because it does. Now, look, Raw's going to be on Netflix, right? So you can get, a lot of, you can get away with a lot of things on, on Netflix that you couldn't get away with on even cable television. But it's still Raw. It's still Rock. And, and if it goes too far, you're going to have advertisers. You're going to have sponsors. They're going to go, eh, yeah, I, yeah, I know it's rock and it's wrestling, but this is just a little too much. That's the part that worries me. I Obviously, I'm, I, I talk like a, a trucker. I, I, get, uh, I, I have their, the, the, the vocabulary sometimes of a sailor. Oh, a sailor. There you go. Yeah. And I get it. And, and, but I'm also aware of that. And sometimes I've tried to, you're slow not doing an old TV, yeah. Slow, slow my roll a little bit, even on this show, because I don't want to affect, you know, I realize even on this show, we've got some advertisers that have been with us for five or six years, right? Manscaped, for example, you know, a lot of them. What, buddy, the those. things I've said on Manscaped, you can't do no harm. You know what I mean? Not, well, not with Manscaped, because they've got a very <laughs> But there, there are other advertising agencies where there are people we don't know that tune into our show to hear their ad. They have to do a quality check, make sure everything's the way it's supposed to be. And they may hear things that they're just not comfortable having their client in. So even I'm aware of that. And that's on a podcast. Have to be careful. Television, even more so. You just can't, you can't afford to, to create a situation where you've got media buyers and some of the biggest ad agencies in the world Going, yeah, I know wrestling's really popular, but it's just a little too much for this client. You don't want that. Well, here's uh, the actual report. Um, the WWE locker room is reportedly unhappy with The Rock being allowed to curse on TV, while the rest has to stick to PG language, according to a new report from SC Scoops. The hot WWE higher up sent out a memo a few weeks ago to talent reminding them they need to stick to PG language even on social media. Even The Rock gets to drop as many F-bombs as he wants to online, even on live television. Now there's a problem. I am told that a lot of talent are asking why Rock gets a pass and no one else is allowed to curse. The thinking is that even if he is the big movie star, shouldn't he play by the same rules so he can curse and use that to get over, but everyone else is handcuffed? Well, then there's a response from The Rock uh, this weekend where he basically says through an IG post networks and standards and practices have issues with my language, but I'd rather be real than not. I talk from the heart, shoot from the hip and try to always have fun. And clearly it's working. I for one hope that we break the chains of PG and we just get back to the way things used to be. Cause Lord, the rock segments have been super entertaining. Have they not? They have, and I agree with you. I would love to see us get away from the, when I say us, I don't mean content-wise as much. It's not like, I mean, the kind of language that we're talking about, the kind of stuff that Rock's been saying, particularly in social media, occasionally, appropriately done, can enhance the story or the moment and make it more interesting and feel more real and honest because that is how people talk. It's how politicians talk. It's how teachers talk. It's how business executives talk. Maybe not in public, not when they're on camera, but it is the conversation of our life across the boards for the most part. Not everybody, but for the most part. And sometimes done judiciously and appropriately. Um, yeah, it can make things feel more real. It can have that kind of, I don't want to say shock value because nobody's shocked but it definitely makes you take notice when you hear something in terms of, you know, F-bombs or whatever that you wouldn't normally hear on television. It gets your attention. That's the purpose of it. But when it's done too frequently, it then becomes boring 
it becomes a crutch. That's it's the best special. way to say it. It yeah. becomes a crutch, much like blood and extreme violence and you know jumping off a fucking ladder that the referee's holding for you onto a plate of glass when there's nobody around just so you can say you did it. And you have that small, we're talking about Darby Allen specifically, and you've got that small little hardcore bloodthirsty group of fucking idiots that think that that's what wrestling is. And oh my God, this is all, this is awesome, right? That's if that's as far as you're going to, uh, to, to appeal to your audience and you rely upon that too much, it, it hurts the product overall because you're relying on that as opposed to great character and great story. Same is true when you rely on F bombs and a type of, you know, R rated type of narrative that we're, we're seeing a little bit on social media from rock or even on television. Um, if you rely upon it too much, none of it matters. It, it won't matter. It'll, it'll quit being an effective tool. And perhaps that's what WWE is trying to do. They're trying to find that, sweet spot where you can judiciously from a creative perspective allow a talent or within a specific story for a good reason to step into that world of reality vis-a-vis -vis their narrative and some of the language they use but you want to control it if all of a sudden everybody's doing it it won't matter anymore and then what do you have you know you're you're you have to be careful, and I, I want to believe that that's what WWE is trying to do. They're not saying, no, never, you're never going to be able to do it. I'm hoping that they're looking at this particular situation. Yes, there's some latitude, because after all, it is The Rock. He is Dwayne Johnson. There's going to be some latitude there, folks, just like there has been with every top talent in every company in the world, whether it's a television company, movie company, whatever. Your top talent is going to be able to get latitude that a lot of other talents aren't. That's just a fact of life. But I'm hoping that they're trying to be judicious about it, and, and the talent will understand. I find it interesting. I don't even know who SC Scoops is. I don't, I don't know any of the people behind it. I've seen them post stories before, but I don't have much of an opinion about them or the quality of their stories. But much like Bad Faith... When, when a story starts out with the, less, the wrestling locker room, almost as if they're trying to give you the impression that they were back there doing interviews, right? And they're talking to all the people in the locker room. That's the implication. That's the inference, right? The locker room in general is upset. You may have one or two people that are going, hey, how, how come Rock gets to say fuck you and I don't? But all of a sudden, it's being reported as the wrestling locker room. Uh, Eh, I probably isn't as big of an issue as SC Scoops is making it out to be. Well, I'll tell you what is a, a bigger issue for a lot of us that maybe we haven't made it out to be a bigger issue. Pre-diabetes. Cygnos is a, is a proud sponsor here on the show, and we are proud to share this information with you. Because I have to admit, boy, before I learned about Cygnos, I was kind of ignorant to the way all of this worked. Cygnos is a really special company that is going to help you in more ways than I can describe here. I mean, it was a whole education for me. And I just want to remind you that the CDC estimates that there are approximately 96 million American adults, more than one in three who have pre-diabetes. And of those with pre-diabetes, more than like 80% don't even know they have it. Now, why does this matter? Well, foods that are high in carbohydrates raise your blood sugar more than other foods. And during digestion, the pancreas produces insulin, which then binds the sugar in the blood and takes it to the cells as a source of energy. Now, if you have prediabetes, the sugar begins to build up in the bloodstream rather than fuel the cells. And that's when insulin resistance occurs. And most people believe that's the number one cause of prediabetes. So the reality is a healthy weight allows insulin to work more efficiently and can help to keep blood sugars within a normal range and a healthy diet and regular exercise are the best ways to keep your blood sugar levels in a healthy range. But what Cygnos helps you do is short circuits the, the cycle here by using data directly from your body. And then it creates a weight loss plan that's unique to you and your lifestyle. 
my wife is in the clinical medical research business. And when this showed up to our house and she unboxed what she called the CGM and I said, oh, you did a what? It's a continuous glucose monitor. She said, honey, this is a real medical device. And that's what you get with Cygnos. It also pairs with an AI driven app to deliver you real time glucose monitoring for optimal health and weight management. You see with Cygnos, you can literally see which foods cause your blood sugar to spike above reasonable levels and even get real time alerts. Maybe it's time to do a little bit of exercise to bring it back down. On average, people make like 227 different food choices per day, but this will teach you to learn the difference between stress eating and physical hunger. It'll also help you better manage your, your energy throughout the day. So you can sleep better at night. You'll even notice things like, Hey, that glass of wine really threw me off or mm. Hey, maybe I need to go do a short walk. That actually helped more than I thought. Signos removes the guesswork of weight loss and provides you with the tools and knowledge that you need to develop healthier habits. It combines your real time glucose data from the CGM, or as we called it, the continuous glucose monitor, and it all goes straight to an AI driven app to deliver you real time glucose insights for optimal health and weight management. And right now, Cygnos has an offer exclusively for our listeners. Go to Cygnos.com, that's S-I-G-N-O-S.com, and get up to 20% off select plans by using the code 83 weeks today. That's Cygnos.com. Use the code 83 weeks, and you'll get 20% off plans today. Eric, let's do uh, a few questions here. We got a ton. I don't think there's any chance we get to them all. I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Let's see if Silva can keep up. Uh, Anthony Russo, boy, he's coming in a little negative. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Eric, is AEW still around in five years? I think in one way, shape, or form it will be. I mean, Tony has an unlimited amount of money, and he's not accountable. It, let me put it this way. If Tony was an executive working for a, a, a wrestling company, had he been hired to book and manage a wrestling company, he'd have been fired a long time ago. But that's not the case. He's not accountable. It's his money. If he wants to spend it however he wants to spend it, he's not accountable to anybody. And as such, he's able to do things that he wants to do as a wrestling fan. Now, I think there's some vulnerability when it comes to television contracts and his ability to keep his show on a established platform because while he's not a Tony's not accountable financially to anybody other than himself, that real estate that he's occupying on in primetime television that's somebody else's responsibility. Somebody else has, has to be responsible for that and make good decisions and, and getting a return on the investment of that beachfront property called primetime television. That may become a problem for Tony, but Tony's got enough money that he could buy his way on. He could probably buy a small television network. Um, Impact did. Impact, you know, I mean, will it be... A round will that will, will AEW the the company be around? Yes. Will it be around in the the same way we recognize it today? I, if I had to bet, if I was in an investment person and I had to to consult with people about making investments into entertainment properties, I wouldn't invest a nickel in AEW in terms of its long term growth or its ability to sustain its position on national television but it'll always be around because tony's passionate about it it's his baby it's it's what he loves and he's got enough money to keep it going for as long as he wants to it's just probably not on national television in my opinion again hopefully i'm wrong i'd love to be wrong i'd love to get up tomorrow morning and read how Warner Brothers Discovery just signed a new five-year deal with AEW, and they've got an increase. As Tony predicted, Tony, well, he didn't predict it. He said all three shows will get a significant increase. He said that three weeks ago. I hope it's true. We'll find out. The Green Devil 
wants to know would Eric return to WWE in some capacity now that the takeover is complete and in what capacity would he like? Absolutely not. Again, it's, and it's not because I don't like people there. I'd love the opportunity to Bruce and I never really got to work together in WWE. We were both looking forward to that when I went back in 2019, but Bruce was going through a lot. He was moving from Dallas to, or Houston to, to Connecticut. There were some other issues going on in Bruce's life. So we never really ever got a chance to sit down and start working together. And I would love that opportunity to work with Bruce, but that's not real for me anymore. Because in order for me to do that, that means what? I'd have to move back to Connecticut. Guess what's never going to happen? Ever, 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 ever going to happen under any circumstances. That would be my ass living in Connecticut. This is not going to happen. And there's no other way that an opportunity like that could exist. Can't do it on a Zoom. Can't really be a part of that business remotely. You have to be in that business 24-7, you have to, it's been used and abused so many times, but you have to live it and breathe it and sleep it. And I'm just not there anymore. I have other things in my life. I'm, I'm going to be 69 years old this month, next month. Hey now. And I know it's my favorite, right? I'm looking forward to it. And at this stage of my life, and I'm healthy as fuck. I'm probably healthier now than I was when I was 35, to be honest about it. I have energy, my, you know, mentally, emotionally, physically, I'm in a much better place than I've ever been as an adult, realistically. But I want to apply that to other things. I don't want to go back to doing something that I've already done. And not to sound like an arrogant asshole, I've been to the mountaintop. I've achieved something nobody thought could be achieved when I turned WCW around and turned it into a profit center and became the number one wrestling company in the the world at that point in time, at least on television. I've done all of that. I've traveled the world. I've made friends with Muhammad Ali. I've jogged in North Korea. I've, I've done so much stuff that why would I want to go back to a business where I could never achieve that level of success again? I can't get motivated about that. And it's unrealistic to think that I ever could achieve that level of success in today's environment. It's not going to happen. So the idea of going back to a business that I'll never be as successful in as I once was, I can't even describe how unappealing that is to me. It's, it's just not comprehensible. Let's do another one here. This is from uh, Cleveland screamer, not to be confused with Cleveland steamer. Uh, what is something <laughs> people about you? What is something people assume about you that you wish people didn't? Hmm, that's a good question. You know, I don't know. I don't know how other people look at me, to be honest with you. I mean, I've certainly heard things that people said about me that weren't true, and but I don't know that people assume that it is. Sometimes people say things about you just to get attention or to take a shot, people that don't even really know me. Um, and I'm used to all that. That's fine. It comes with the territory. I've been used to that for 35 years. No big deal. But in terms of what people assume about me, I don't know, Conrad, you're probably better better equipped to comment on that than I am. I don't know. I think people think you're way more arrogant and cocky than you really are. I mean, don't get me wrong. Sometimes easy E you turn up the volume, uh, in a performance, but then in real life, you're just Eric. I mean, uh, like when you boil it down, I've heard people say, like I heard Kevin Nash say once, Hey man, Hulk's just a dude. And I've heard once, you know, Bruce years ago, before all the nonsense came out, Bruce said, man, Vince is just a dude. And I would kind of say the same thing about Eric. Like the the perception of you and the reality of you are different. That, and I, I, that's probably self-inflicted. I probably create a lot of that, you know, because I get emotional. The easy E in me comes back out of the performance is always going to be there because I love performing. And it's part of the reason why I love doing this show is it still gives me a chance every once in a while to put my, my toe in the water and and perform a little bit, even if it's just for a few moments here or there. But um, yeah, some of that is self-inflicted, but I think I'm pretty down to earth. You know, I don't, I I, I don't need much anymore. My, my ideas of success are way different now than they were, you know, 20 years ago. Success for me looks so much different than, than it did 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago. I'm pretty down to earth and I don't really have that high of an opinion of myself which doesn't mean that I'm, I don't believe in my convictions and I'm firm in them. I am, 
But yeah, I don't know. I, th- I don't know. I'm pretty basic. Do, uh, well, I, I, I would agree with that. You're easy. Uh, you're easy. Uh, let's do one from Mitch. This is a great question about the old days. Nitro and Raw seem to have entrant tramps on opposite sides of the rings. Was that an intentional decision to be different than? Of course, what Mitch is talking about is from the hard cam perspective on Monday Night Raw, you would see talent come in from the left. Whereas on Nitro, from a hard cam perspective, you would see talent come in from the right. Is it that simple? You wanted to be different than? Gosh, I don't know. I've never noticed that before, but that would probably be my first question or my first observation. They just want to be different. You know, it's hard to separate the two shows. One's red, one's blue, right? One's got one roster and the other's got another, but it's still WWE. And finding ways to distinguish between those brands, sometimes they're really big things, sometimes they're not. You know, the colors are an obvious one. Well, I'm, we're talking about Raw and Nitro back in the day. Oh, Raw and Nitro. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about Raw and SmackDown. Um, no, that wasn't part of the equation. Not that I can recall. It's just it one of those things. Way. It just happened. Yeah. Just worked out that way. Yeah. Uh, Carlos Estrada says, and I know you love fantasy booking. It's your favorite. You're starting a new <laughs> promotion. You get two single male stars, two single female stars, and one tag from any promotion. Who are you choosing? So this I don't is, know. I, I have to give that some thought. It takes too much time to think through this, something like that on a podcast, but I'll, I'll post something later on. How's that? Is there a single talent that jumps to mind, whether it's male, female, or tag, where you're like, I don't know, but they're on the list? Yeah, there's probably a lot of them or several of them. I just, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. I've only had three cups of coffee. I can't think through it right now. Sorry. Uh, I I would think, you know, if we're going to play that game while you're thinking about it later and you're going to post on social, you got to go with some youth, I would think. I mean, if you're trying to build a promotion, you want to get people you think you can hopefully keep stuck around for a while. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, I know this is going to sound crazy, right? But I really, really... I just got a powerfully good feeling about Will Osprey. Yep. And not even the, I mean, obviously the work in the ring, right? The presentation was otherworldly in many respects, but that's not what got me the most excited about him, believe it or not. There's something, he has that it, you know, that it factor. Yes. That you can't really define. You can't put it in a pill, you can't put it in a bottle. You can't wear it. You can't manufacture it. There's something different about this cat that I think is magic that could be really built upon. Time will tell if we if if he reaches his potential as a character and we see some of that charisma. If that becomes a thing and, and, and is built upon in AEW, I would love to see him in WWE. I would love to see Will Ospreay with that magic that he has, that it factor he has, combined with his amazing abilities in the ring, but in an environment that builds story and other characters around him as opposed to just going out there and having, you know, Dave Meltzer circle jerk four-star matches. Oh, that's yeah. not gonna get that's not gonna get him anywhere. That'll that he'll reach a certain level and he'll stay right there. But I think he has the potential of being a major, major star, just not an AEW. Boy, I didn't want to bring this up, but you mentioned his name and you, you said what you said about matches and match ratings. So I got to reference it. Over the weekend, there was a, a big debate and discussion online because I guess someone was defending Kurt Angle, if you will, saying, mm-hmm. How in the world did Kurt Angle never get a five star match from Dave Meltzer? And John Moxley did. Now, I'm not here to throw shade at John Moxley at all. He's been the MVP in a lot of ways for AEW almost since the beginning. But Kurt Angle, my goodness, one of the best all-time wrestlers. I mean, goodness gracious. If he's on your Mount Rushmore, who could be critical of that? That being said, when someone tried to take Dave to task for that, he quote tweeted it and said something along the lines of, go study cage match and get back to me. (laughs) <laughs> and i said to myself self that's fucking stupid 
when Kurt Angle was doing what Kurt Angle was doing, and I'm talking about peak Kurt Angle, not the TNA stuff. I know he was there a lot longer. I know we had arguably as good or better matches, but I'm saying when he was in front of the much bigger audience of WWE, cage match was not nearly as prevalent as it is now. And it's only become uh, gained a little more steam in recent years because of Tony Khan. And because we're making fun of it <laughs> based on fan voting. I respect what cage match does. Like what a great little community of diehard, hardcore wrestling fans. But at the same time, fans are rushing to the computer after a show now to rate a match and rate a show. They weren't doing that in the Kurt angle days. So what in the world are we saying? Like, Hey, go study where fans vote and get back with me. What fans weren't able to vote back then like they are now. I, I, and that's not that's not even the point. The point is that Dave lives in a world all of his own, and he he assumes that his view of looking at wrestling is the best way. I mean, look, Tony Khan is essentially booking for Dave Meltzer. Now they, they may not, you know, they may even debate, they may even argue over the phone, they may not even get along. I don't know. I don't give a fuck. Doesn't matter to me. I get along. Uh, that's kind of what I thought, but I don't want to imply it because I don't know it for sure, but whatever, let's assume they're, they're at least sociable. Dave Meltzer has a view of what works in wrestling. And I think Tony Khan subscribes to it a hundred percent. Unfortunately, it's fucking wrong. And now it's being, you know, Dave for years has, has always known a better way has always had a different opinion. And now Tony Khan is out there manifesting Dave Meltzer's approach to professional wrestling. And he's shitting the bed in the process in terms of television. It's not getting him anywhere. He's dying. House show tickets there. Do they even do house shows anymore? I don't even think no, they do. No, they, they can't. They're not even in the live event business which is a weird thing to say for a professional wrestling company. They're not even in the live event side of the business and their television product is weak at best. Their attendance for their television productions, dynamite, their number one show. They're lucky to get 3000 people. They have to paper the house to get there according to recent reports. So there's no metric that you can look at, to suggest that Dave Meltzer's view of the wrestling business, because he, as he says, he studies it and, you know, he's such a student of the business, but everything that Dave Meltzer suggests is the right way to do things is manifesting in AEW and it's failing miserably. So in a way, AEW's failure to succeed beyond their current level is in large part because of the Dave Meltzer philosophy of professional wrestling, which Tony Khan clearly subscribes to. It's not working. And the idea that Dave Meltzer would ref refer to cage match rankings as some kind of barometer that has any credibility in terms of what's working and what's not working on television and what's quality and not quality on television, I think tells you every, not you Conrad, but tells one everything one needs to know about Dave Meltzer's experience, his perspective, or his under basic fundamental understanding of professional wrestling as a business. Dave Meltzer has no clue. He's never been in the business. Now I know there's a lot of sports writers that have never played professional sports and they comment on sports writing. Great. But we're talking about business. The guy, Dave Meltzer, who says he studies the business. No, you don't, Dave. You're a fucking goof. You've never studied the business. You're a dirt sheet writer. You've probably never been in a business outside of writing dirt sheets. But Dave's, Dave has always tried to influence the product as best he could from the sidelines. Well, now he's got a great opportunity because Tony Khan is a student of Dave Meltzer and look what you're getting. And it's becoming more and more obvious. And I think that that reference to check out the cage match rankings is only one example of what a moron Dave Meltzer is. Okie doke. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Marty B says, now that we have a direction for the main event of night one at WrestleMania, how would you finish night one, Eric? And then the obvious question, how would you finish night two? Would you throw any surprises in there? Like Seth turning on Cody again, it's falls into the fantasy booking category. And I I'm intentionally not thinking too much about 
what I would do because honestly, I want to enjoy what they're what they are doing. I want to be surprised. I don't even want to be able to predict too much. I want to sit back and just watch it and see see what's going to happen as a fan, not as a former producer. And in order for me to turn my producer brain off, I just have to quit thinking about it and just enjoy it. In terms of Seth turning on Cody, I wouldn't do that because that's five pounds. It's like 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. I just wouldn't do it then. Maybe after, maybe something happens in the match that, that, allows us to create a Cody Seth story going forward. Like that's the opening act of act one in the new Seth Cody story that can happen right at WrestleMania, but I wouldn't want to see a real, a, a full on turn at WrestleMania because it's too much too soon and not necessary in that moment. In my opinion, can't wait to see what they do there. Uh, let's talk about championship belts, wrestling fans and science says, hello, Eric. Hope all is well. I know WWE already has enough championships as is with all the factions they've been putting together. Do you think they possibly could have a six man tag team division before you answer Eric? Let me just say, please, God, no, we've seen a six man in AEW. We've seen a six man in ring of honor. I think if anything, it's just hurt their tag team division. Like I'd rather have a badass tag team division than trying to have a tag team division and the six man tag, much less two sets of six mans. What say you? Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I, I could just, I could go off on a tangent about six man tags and no, no. Suffice, suffice. Oh, fuck me. I just, <laughs> out of trip. It's just, Oh, see, I run out of gimmick ideas. Let's do a gimmick of a gimmick. Ah, yeah, and we'll call it trios because I don't know. Sounds cool. No, no, fuck no. Stop it. Stop it. Melt those belts. Put them up at auction. Donate them to charity. Whatever the fuck. But don't create a sick. Hey, uh, let me ask you this. We saw over the weekend, I don't know if you saw, but there was a report, I guess about a week or so back that John Moxley just re-upped a new deal and allegedly he's going to be exclusive except for AEW's international partners. So meaning he could go down and wrestle for CMLL or AAA or go over and wrestle for New Japan. But it certainly seems like his days of moonlighting a little bit here and there for Game Changer Wrestling are over. And then over the weekend, it was announced that Josh Barnett, who puts together a WrestleMania weekend spectacular every year, it's different than, and it's called Bloodsport. And he got Triple H to allow Shayna Baszler to participate. This is something we haven't seen before. You know, under the old regime, they would go out of their way to block every building and every event within the vicinity of WrestleMania. They didn't want WrestleCon. They didn't want every indie in America to run shows that are based on them bringing WrestleMania to the market. They would legitimately go out and rent buildings. They had no intentions of using. They would get holds on buildings and then cancel them at the last minute because all these buildings were so desperate to do business with WWE. They'd much rather have WWE there than some outfit they've never heard of. So by the time WWE pulled the hold, it was too late. The guy, the local promoter couldn't sell tickets. This is a real about face. Now we've got main roster talent appearing at work to shoot indie shows on WrestleMania weekend for other promotions. Like this is a whole new world now, Eric, is it not? Do you think it's possibly a reaction to the MLW suit? Oh, I had not thought of that. That's interesting. Yeah, seems like that to me. You don't think it's possible that Triple H just sees wrestling differently than Vince did? Fuck no. Okay. There's a re- there's a reason behind it. I don't know that that, that that's the reason, but if you just, you know, There's a dot, there's a dot, there's a dot. Let's connect them and see what the picture looks like. You know, a $20 million settlement because the perception is that WWE is uh, trying to be a monopoly. monopoly. 
yeah. and are freezing other people out of the business, what better way to overcome that than to allow talent that it's an independent contractor, technically speaking, to be able to provide services to a another wrestling promoter within the industry? Could be, not saying it is, but that's the first thing that crosses my mind, is that this is a reaction to a situation as opposed to an ideological change. Well, let's do, uh, let's talk about something else that's changing. And this is from Cody Rhodes is a Jedi. What a great handle that is with prime ads now being on the ring, every, uh, PLE, what other changes do you think are coming that Vince McMahon would not allow? Well, we've certainly heard people say the word wrestling more on TV. Is there anything else you can think of besides Shayna appearing at a non WWE shows or something else? You know, one of the one of the things that I had a hard time adjusting to when I was a talent in WWE was the idea that I had to wear a sport coat and tie on a plane. You know, Vince was just obsessed with the appearance of talent even before they got to the building. And I heard a story, and I certainly don't know if it's a true story or not, but the story I heard when all of this went down, because there was a point in time when uh, even when I worked there initially as a talent, you didn't have to wear a suit. You didn't have to show up at the building in your sport coat and tie and all that bullshit. But evidently Vince was out somewhere and saw some talent getting in and out of a car and they were wearing their sweats and they looked like, you know, they looked like they were going to the gym and they might've been for all that, for all I know. But evidently that upset Vince so much that some of his top talent looked like they were going to work at a Jiffy Lube that it became a policy that independent contractors, including me at the time, had to wear a sport coat, dress shoes, and slacks on a flight. Because the, the theory was, oh, WWE is paying for that flight. In my case, they were at least. So therefore, they can tell you how they want you to represent the company while you're utilizing the ticket that they paid for. You can't really argue that. I mean, I couldn't. I wasn't willing to at the point in time. It wasn't necessary. But I hated it. I just hated the idea of having to travel wearing a sport coat and tie or worrying about if, if, if Vince was going to see me outside of the venue, if he was going to be upset, the fact that I wasn't dressed like I was going to work as an accountant. Um, I'm hoping that some of the, not hoping, I don't care if it does or doesn't, but I would imagine that some of those weird Vince things like dress codes, that'll probably be relaxed. I would hope for the talent's sake, because it is a pain in the ass, real pain in the ass. But other than that, I don't know, man. It's been so long since I've been there. I, I don't know. Well, something that has changed for both you and I, we've changed our deodorant and we've made a big change to our friends at Mando. Mando is the real deal. We have both used this and I got to tell you, I don't know who liked it more, me or my wife. Check it out for yourself right now. It's whole body odor control. You can get it hooked up at shopmando.com and you can even get a discount when you use our promo code 83 weeks. I've used it. I use it every day. My wife does too. That's a real statement. She absolutely loves it. And the reality is things are warming up right now. And let's be honest, that leads to a... Uh, <clears throat> funkier smells for us human being <laughs> it could even lead to a funkier smell not just in your armpits but down yonder you know where i'm talking about well grab some mando whole body deodorant and nip that odor in the bud you can put it on your pits you can put it on your feet you can put it you know there too put it on your ass it all works <laughs> From the makers of Lumi deodorant, Mando is clinically proven to work hard all day. Instead of covering up BO with heavy fragrances, what Mando does is stop the odor at the source, stopping the stink from happening in the first place. So spring into season with a deodorant that can handle the heat. New customers can get $5 off a starter pack when you use our exclusive link and code right now, that's shopmando.com, S H O P M A N D O, shopmando.com. 
And I want to remind you, this is good for everywhere. It's not just for your armpits, but your belly button, those stinky crevices. Maybe you got some belly fat. Maybe you got some folds. You got some feet. You got a butt crack. You got your grundle. You got your balls. You got your gimmick. What about your asshole right now? <sighs> why not get rid of all that? Mando is something you don't have to worry about, by the way. It's baking soda free. It's cruelty free. It's dye free. It's aluminum free. And you need to be stink free. Mando can help you with that. By the way, this is also vegan. It's clinically proven to control odor better than soap alone. 12 hours after a shower, the average man's grundle odor is like a five out of 10. But with Mando, the average grundle odor is a zero out of 10. If you want a 10 out of 10 from your uh, person who does special things for you, I don't know what makes them want to do that, but I know what makes them not want to do that. Being a zero out of 10 is going to, going to come in handy. We want you to check out the starter pack. It's got the solid stick deodorant. That's what I've been rocking. They got the cream tube deodorant. They got two free products of your choice, like a mini body wash or the deodorant wipes. And oh, by the way, free shipping. Now, luckily we got a discount code to hook you up, get your favorite smelling whole body deodorant on the market right now. Get $5 off this starter pack when you use our code. That's like 40% off your starter pack. Go right now to shopmando.com. S-H-O-P-M-A-N-D-O.com. Use our code 83 weeks. It's time to smell better naked, boys. Your partner will thank you. Never thought we'd say grundle here on the show, Eric. That's I love one. that product, by the way. I'm going to order some because I'm out. I'm going to order some using my own promo code. Good. Yeah. I absolutely love this product. Really love it. It's a great, great, great product. Mine m missing. Here's what happened. I got out of the shower, get and dry it off, getting ready to go to the office, do my thing, go to grab my deodorant. It's not there. It's always on my countertop to the left of my sink. Been there forever. That's my routine. And I'm thinking, well, where the hell is it? Now, that's the only deodorant I use now. It has been that way for months. So I'm looking all over. I'm even looking in my travel bag. Like maybe I got an extra stick there. And I'm thinking I'm out. I don't know what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm out. I guess I go grab a bottle of water out of the kitchen and the fridge. It's on the uh, kitchen Island. I asked Megan when she got home, I said, uh, did you still want deodorant?" She goes, man, that shit's awesome. Isn't it? And I'm like, okay, there we go. Even your ladies will use it. Mando.com. I'm sorry. Shop Mando.com. That's S H O P M A N D O.com. Use the code 83 weeks. Uh, let's do a few more questions here, man. Um, w D W plan tunes says, was there ever corporate training programs at Turner? How did you navigate the transition from announcing to producing to being an executive within Turner corporate? It's something we never talked about. Were there any classes? <laughs> not, not traditional classes, but there were, um, probably once or twice a year, human resources would require that executives attended, um, I guess, classes, if you will. Seminar is probably a better way to say it in terms of how to best deal with sexual harassment situations and that type of HR issue. Those happen frequently. Um, and you do some role playing, you know, that was always kind of silly and fun. I, uh, I found them to be interesting. And, and helpful in my case, because I'd never worked in a corporate environment before. And there are issues in a corporate environment, particularly a publicly held company, that you just really have to be aware of that you probably wouldn't think about or deal with in, in the course of your normal everyday life um, as a private citizen or working for a small company, or in my case, being self-employed. So I found those to be helpful. But beyond that, no, there was no, uh, I get a lesson every day. You know, I, I was being schooled by all kinds of people within Turner Broadcasting, especially early on about how Turner functioned and my responsibilities with on the, within the team and things like that. Harvey Schiller taught me a lot. Bill Shaw taught me a lot. Bill Shaw was really a mentor for me. Of course, Bill Shaw was a VP of Human Resources for Turner Broadcasting. So my first year or so, 18 months with WCW, I was under the direct mentorship tutelage, if you will, of Bill Shaw. So I learned a lot from Bill, but it wasn't really in a classroom type of setting. 
Here's an interesting uh, question we've never discussed before. OPW Chris says AEW pay-per-views were broadcast in movie theaters the past few years. Now it looks like theater showings have come to an end. From outside looking in, and as someone who has run a company, why would why would one eliminate guaranteed revenue? Bars and restaurants are still paying to show it. I think the answer here, Eric, is as you know, AEW licenses real music they're not just using mikey ruckus and in-house musicians to create theme songs so because they're actually licensing music i think the license to air on television is different than the license to air in a theater that's what i've been told either that or nobody's coming to the theater to watch it oh will you stop no i mean that's the other option what you said could be true that could be the issue kind of don't think so but it's possible um because usually distribution agreements when it comes to licensing include all kinds of potential distribution or presentation opportunities they're very much of a blanket now perhaps with with regards to some of that music there were restrictions on it which would prevent the prevent their product from being shown in a theater if that music is utilized that is a possibility. I don't think so. I think it's just the case that, yeah, they're shown in theaters, but nobody's coming to watch. And if I own a theater and I'm spending money to present a product and there's only four people there, I'm probably not going to do it for very long. That's my bet. I um, I think movie theaters are looking for anything they can get these days. It does feel like they're on their last legs. But the word I got was like, a song like seek and destroy because that's the 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 biggest one that comes to mind because sting just used it on the most recent pay-per-view in the main event i don't think they had permission i think it's a whole new set of expenses to show it in the theater and i would guess whatever that cost is doesn't really warrant the need well then you'd have to do some math right you'd have to break out your calculator and go wait a minute i'm spending all this money for music it's not really helping my television ratings much I can't really bring people to the arenas. That's dying. Um, Now I can't go to a movie theater because I want to use music, certain music. Why not quit using that music? Because it's not working for you anyway, dude. It's It's not generating revenue. So why do it? Because he wants to. Huh? (laughs) I know this sounds silly, but it's the same reason he started AEW. He wants to. No, then great. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but you and I are approaching a lot of these conversations from a pragmatic business owner standpoint. Mm -hmm. This is a cat who realistically has infinite money. So why, why'd you play that theme song? It costs a lot of money because I wanted to. Okay. Okay. So he's a money mark that can do whatever he wants. And he's not responsible to anybody but himself because he wants to. That's fine. That's just fine. (sighs) Good for him. I mean, are you gonna? I mean, is there anybody if you googled money mark and Tony Khan's picture doesn't come up? I don't know what who's would. This guy is the personification of money mark. I don't know, I I don't know how anybody could deny that. But the well, listen, if you allegedly there's been business valuations done of this company. (laughs) Now, listen, I know you're laughing, but here's what I'm saying. Remember, once upon a time, they said Twitter, Twitter was worth all this cash, but it was still hemorrhage okay. cash every year. I mean, the, the, a lot of these startups and, and tech companies, they'll tell you, oh, we've got this so-and-so billion-dollar valuation. Well, how do your books look? Well, we lost $50 million last year. But now, come on, Conrad. You know I'm just better. saying, you and I you small know better. I don't know better because I don't know. Are you going to compare a wrestling company to a tech startup when tech's got all the potential in the world? A wrestling company is, it's a television show. Tony Khan is nothing more and nothing less than an independent television producer that's producing a television show. Let's quit trying to pretend he's something else. That's all it is. And it's not working. Well, yeah, but here's all right. I'm not arguing it's not working for you, but if he's about to get a renewal, if he is going to get a renewal, yeah. it's working for someone. But what yeah. I'm saying is true or false. Tony Khan 
has gotten the second largest television rights for wrestling in the history of wrestling on television besides WWE, obviously. Sure. So, I mean, by definition, that but he's he, losing money doing it, but go well, ahead. We don't, know, we, we don't know how much he's losing. We don't know. his Yeah. Book. Okay. That's I mean, we can thing. guess, that, we can guess they're losing money. We, we can be pretty accurate in an assumption that they're losing money. This is, you know, it's it's the words we choose. Words have meaning. If he's if he was making money, we would all know about it, and Dave would be shouting it from the mountaintops. His his little puppy, Dave Meltzer, he'd be shouting it from the mountaintops. Tony Khan is not making money; he's losing money, and is going to continue losing money. So the idea that somehow he's got this television company. A, a production company that's producing professional wrestling that can't draw people to the arena consistently, that's deteriorating in the ratings on a regular basis, and is overall kind of mismanaged from the outside looking in, that that has some kind of relative value to a startup tech company or to a sports organization. Kind of Dave Meltzer saying, yeah, but what about all these sports companies that are, you know, these teams and the value of teams? It's not a fucking team. It's not a sport. It's a television company that produces professional wrestling. And it's doing so on a really, really um, shaky basis to suggest that there's some kind of intrinsic value and it's going to be worth billions of dollars because, I don't know, a startup tech company follows that. Kind oh, of no, no. That's not what I said, Eric. Now, come on. What I said was I made the analogy that when something's new, it takes a few years before it becomes profitable. And if he gets this big, like if you were an NFL player and you're going to get drafted here in a few weeks, everybody knows you're working for that second contract. That's where you make your big like lifetime money. The first contract's good. Gets you in the game. You prove your worth. The second contract's where you cash in. I got to think that's what Tony's thinking here. And that's probably what he and his dad have seen time and time again in, in their management of real sports. Well, I, I would, I would, I'd sign up for that. If there was growth, if there was an indication that Tony's toy box was growing and was becoming more successful, if there was any indication that there was growth in the future, I would tend to want to believe that. But the opposite is true. And anything, you know this kind of way better than I do, Value is relative. Something is only as, as valuable as somebody else is willing to spend on it. Yeah, that's true. And if you look at what AEW is, if you look at the expenses, look at their video game, which, by the way, we don't hear much about that video game, do we? Because they lost a fucking fortune doing it because they don't know what they're doing. They were incompetent in its design and implementation. It failed miserably, and they spent a fortune. I've heard the number from people in the industry. I'm not going to repeat it because I don't know it's a fact, and I don't do that shit. That's what Dave Meltzer does. But if the number that I heard from three different sources is close to being accurate, it was a disaster. And then you look at everything else around AEW that's not working, as we've discussed. It's only worth what somebody's able to pay for it. And why would anybody want to spend any amount of money on that company unless you're Tony Khan and you grew up fantasizing about being a wrestling promoter and now your dad gives you a billion dollars and you can go do whatever the fuck you want to do. That's what it is. It's a really well-funded independent wrestling company that's run by a guy who is a fan of wrestling or money mark. That's what it is. And to suggest that that's going to be worth billions of dollars because WWE is or because a hockey team is or because a, a soccer team is, is just another, that's kind of like the cage match reference. Yeah. Just go look at, you know, look at the value of, you know, professional sports leagues and then tell me AEW is not worth more money. I mean, all right. It's, it's the cage match rankings analogy. Well, I mean, listen, you and I both know, there have been a few people who are interested in buying AEW. I mean, really? I don't know that. You and I talked about it before. I'll remind you, you out there. Yeah. No, I'm interested. Uh, let's 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 move on from talking about AEW. Let's give it a break for a minute. Josh Henney mm -hmm. wants to know 
Uh, happy 316 day, which was this past week. Did Stone Cold ever give you any tips on how to take the stunner? Mm, no. Just did it. You, you um you've been paying somebody else, somebody else may have I, Steve didn't I may have worked with there may have been an agent the first time or two I did it that that kind of walked me through it but I, I don't remember who it was but you know I mean it's not that hard I'm gonna kick you in the stomach you're gonna bend over I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do and sell it I mean, if you've seen it on television you can pretty much figure it out would you be surprised to see Austin at WrestleMania no I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I would be surprised if we don't see him because of just the level of interest and the excitement and enthusiasm. And Steve is still out there. You know, he's still in business. We saw him do a, a commercial on uh, on Super Bowl. He's still, you know, he's still out there. He's not he's not crawled into a hole out there in Nevada on his ranch, and he's still out there. So yeah, I, I expect to see him. And plus, it would be fun. I mean, if I was Steve Austin, I'd want to be a part of it. If I if I'm Steve Austin, I want to run in and give the rock a stunner. That's what I want to do. Yeah. That'd be a fun conversation to see in the back room. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I know they had a professional rivalry and I know that the rocks on the board, but let's remind everybody the rocks first WrestleMania main event was WrestleMania 15 in Philadelphia against stone cold. You telling me stone cold with well, the stunner on the 25th anniversary wouldn't hit. Come on. Ooh, I'd be all about that. That's fun. Um, let's talk a little bit about the bloodline. We've talked a little bit about a W maybe a little too much. Kevin Crowley says just as important as how they choose to end this part of the bloodline story is what they follow it up with. True. I think of how interest dropped off a bit with Marvel after finishing the Thanos story arc. What would be your post WrestleMania storyline to keep momentum going? Man, I love that people are thinking along these lines, Eric, because You've told us so many stories of back in the day in WCW where somebody would go pitch creative and then a friend of yours would rub his Fu Manchu and he wouldn't say what you think I'm going to say. That doesn't work for me, brother. He would say, and then what? Yeah. And I think a lot of people are going to be curious on Monday, the Monday after WrestleMania and then what? I mean, is there something lying in wait that you think could keep this thing going immediately? I mean, the rumor in any window is that the rock is going to be doing a movie based on, uh, the smashing machine, Mark Coleman, an excellent documentary. If you've never seen it, uh, Mark Kerr, my apologies. Mark Coleman's on my mind after he just was a hero and saved his, his family dog from a burning house. My goodness. And he's somehow survived and kicked out and he's in the hospital and awake and talking and we're thankful he's here. But anyway, the rock is going to be off making a movie for several months, starting in may. How do you keep some stickiness, some hotness here with WWE with Roman, the bloodline Cody what's next for any of those guys? Have you put any thought to that? Not really. I haven't put any thought to it, but you've got a lot of players right there. You got the Usos in there. Sammy Zayn, who we haven't heard from. For a while it was very instrumental in the bloodline storyline a little over a year ago is there a way to bring sammy zane back into it i think i think Zam, sammy zane was one of the reasons the bloodline story got so exciting last year is there a way to reintroduce him back into the story um i i don't know i haven't given it a lot of thought but because there are so many components of the bloodline so many personalities big name personalities great performers that it's just a matter of imagination. It's just coming up with the right way. Um, I'm sure that it's there, I, but I haven't given it, a, given it a lot of thought. It's going to be interesting to see uh, what they do next uh, and where they go and how they keep this momentum going. Cause I agree. They do have it to a head. I mean, everybody's talking about WrestleMania and seemingly has been for months now. Uh, let's do one from, uh, this is really not a question, a compliment, but I want to, I want to make sure you see it. Jared Turner says not so much a question, but a thank you. I'm a history teacher in Oklahoma and started using a variation of Eric's Sarsa model in class. I'm now a top five finalist for teacher of the year in a district with over 1300 educators. Thanks, Eric. How about that? Easy. How about that? I know this is going to come off like 
you and I talked about this previously, and this is a planned response. It's not. First of all, thank you very much for that. It, it makes me feel good to know that we're talking about things on this show because so much of what we talk about is just, Grand it's ass. just fun. It's just fun. It's not meant to be too serious, but occasionally we share. You do. I know that you do this a lot with regard to mortgages and finance and, and your experience and you've helped a lot of people. And that's what makes this really fun is when you get those brief moments in time where you can actually do something or say something that helps somebody. Um, but with that said, I'm going to be introducing very, very soon on YouTube. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail right now, but you'll be hearing about it and seeing it more. But we're going to do basically a seminar about the SARSA formula and how to apply it to different things outside of wrestling. Very, very cool guy by the name of Ryan McGrath is helping me develop this. And we're going to, you know, people will, people will be able to join us for free on YouTube. And we're going to give examples of how you can take the SARSA for formula, story, anticipation, reality, surprise, and action, and apply it to whatever it is you're doing in life. In this case, um, a teacher and improve and, and grow. So we're going to be doing that. I think we're going to have our first uh, YouTube show in May is what the schedule is right now. So if you're out there, because we get these, you know, I get these comments every once in a while about how people have applied SARSA, that formula to whatever walk of life they're in and have, and have reached out to me in social media and otherwise and, and, and thanked me and talked about their success. So I encourage people, if, you, if you've got that experience, number one, stay tuned, but hit me up in social media, send me a DM, hell no. We may make you part of the show. I love that. That's 83 weeks.com is where you can keep up with all the uh, YouTube updates from all things. Eric Bischoff, uh, John B says, if I were to nitpick, the main thing I personally think is missing from WWE is better ring music for most talents. It feels generic at times. Mm. Everything else seems to be close to perfect point. Is there anything you could improve on? If so, how would you do it? We've really been heaping a lot of praise on WWE lately. Do you think there is any room for improvement? What are some things that you think they could do a better job of? And, and what do you make of the complaint? And I've seen this a lot, that theme music doesn't seem as distinctive now as maybe as it once was. I've heard that a lot as well. I, I don't pay close enough attention to theme music to have an opinion, really. But I think the general consensus of the music being kind of bland and maybe it's because it's all familiar. There's a sameness to the music, which happens when you only have one or two people in charge of creating music. They tend to create what they're good at or what they like or what they have the most experience in. And as a result, things start feeling very similar and with regard to music, and this is so true, this is something I do notice all the time. Do you ever watch the series Suits? No, but I'm familiar with it. It's a really good series. It's kind of cheesy. It's not, you know, it's, it's not great storytelling or, or the, the acting is pretty good some of the times, but it's pretty, you know, it's pretty middle of the road entertainment. But they're, the producers are really good at finding the right music for the right scene, and they do it once an episode. And I look forward to it. And half of my, not half, a good portion of my playlist is music that I've downloaded as a result of seeing a scene. Sometimes I hit my Shazam. Like when I watch the show, I usually have my Shazam ready to go because it's very consistently, I'll hear music that's really emotive, that really supports the scene that we happen to be watching. But I ended up liking the music anyway. Music is really important, really, really important. And I think maybe Jim Johnson, who everybody got so familiar with and did such a great job, and now he's gone. Whoever is producing that music perhaps is guilty of just a sameness, a, a, a similar quality, whether it's the beat. I don't know shit all. I don't know anything about music, but I know what I like. And maybe there's just the sameness to it that is causing this kind of a reaction. I've heard it before, so it's probably true. Lopez says, with the inevitable shift to online streaming, such as Netflix, will the KPI change and ratings no longer matter? That's an interesting one. Do you think that that's not, that's that far off that we stop talking about ratings in wrestling? 
I, you know, until another KPIs key performance indicator for those people who are living under a rock, ratings right now are it. It's the only thing that's out there that we can point to and track that has a history. I'm not going to suggest that it's the most accurate. It just is what it is. It's what makes the world of advertising spin on its fucking axis. And until something else comes along that's more accurate or is generally accepted, ratings are going to be the, the one thing we do have. Not in the streaming industry. I don't know what's on the horizon. I'm certainly not a tech person by any stretch, any stretch of the imagination. But I would imagine as things evolve, as they do, there will come a time when there is some other form of rating system that maybe will be more accurate. We're not there yet, but probably people working on it as we speak. Until then, the only one that really matters is revenue. Because that's what all the KPIs in the world are designed to predict and track. It's revenue. Television ratings are nothing more than a tracking system that advertisers can use to decide the efficiency or determine the efficiency of the money that they're investing in advertising a product on a particular television show. It's all you got, folks. But it's really just a predictor or tracker. At the end of it all, it's just revenue. It's Money is the only thing that makes the real world go around. And these indicators, whether it's ratings or KPIs or streaming comes up with something else, all of them are nothing more than a tool to anticipate, predict, and track revenue. So, sure, there'll be another one coming along. But in the meantime, with regard to WWE, just look at their quarterly financial reports. It's public knowledge. It's a publicly held company. You can see it. You can track it. You can see the growth week or month over month, year over year, decade over decade, if you want to. With AEW or, or Impact or some of these other companies that are privately held, that information is not available, and you have to rely on Dave Meltzer. <laughs> or ratings. But eventually it'll happen. Interesting question from a live experience perspective. Just went to a live raw. This is from D. Just went to a live raw and it was start and stop. Do you think the current production setup where they bring out a star and go to a commercial break hurts when it comes to building momentum and getting someone over? It doesn't help. It's an issue. And I don't know how long commercial breaks are now. They used to be, I think they were two minutes and 30 seconds or two. 245, maybe three minutes when I was producing Nitro uh, or even in TNA. I suspect, I don't know this, could be wrong, but I suspect commercial breaks have gotten longer because while the value of the commercials have decreased over time because of streaming, because of internet advertising, a lot of different reasons, um, because it's harder to it's harder to get a return on your advertising dollar investment with a traditional commercial on a, on a television show. They've started adding more because the cost of the shows are going up. So you've got to figure out a way to create more revenue. And I think the commercial breaks are even longer now than they were when I was producing. It's a long winded way of saying that. And one of the things that we used to do, I started out with DJ Ram. I hired a DJ out of LA. I think he was from LA. He was either LA or New York. Really cool guy, fun guy. And he would, we'd, we'd go to him in our bumpers. Like, so a match is wrapping up, or maybe we just had our three count. Uh, and we'd get a shot, the camera, the crane, we'd get a crane shot flying over. We go over to DJ Rand. We set him up right on the, uh, in the audience, right there. So we were surrounded by people because it added to the vibe. And we'd listen to DJ Rand music into a commercial break. So while we were in a commercial break, the people in the venue were, were jamming to the music, right? We kept them alive. We kept them interested. We kept the energy up. We kept their attention using music. We then, after that, we moved to the Nitro Girls, who did the same exact thing. We were, we're getting ready to go to a commercial break. The Nitro Girls would come out. They'd start performing on stage we'd go to a commercial break the girls would come to the ring they would continue that performance in the ring interact with the audience all of that designed to keep the energy up so that you didn't have that start stop feel emotionally 
You don't want the audience disengaging for three and a half or four minutes. You want to keep that energy and that focus alive. And we used, like I said, DJ ran. We use the Nitro Girls. I'm sure there are other, other things that can be done. But it is an issue, you know, because you get everybody up and then you're dropping them down. And then you try to get them up again, and then you drop them down. You're doing that over the course of three hours of Monday Night Raw, or two hours if it's SmackDown. That's a long time to go up and down and up and down and up and down. And it's hard on talent because, you know, you get the audience up, especially if you're following a really super hot match with a great finish. You get everybody excited, and then we go to a commercial break. And now you got to pick them back up again. It's a lot easier if you can keep them kind of at a mid-level range in terms of focus and energy. And music is a great way to do it. Nitro Girls was a great way to do it. There's probably other ways of doing it, but it is an issue. Good, good, good question. No chance you remember this one. RCS 88 says, when you had your tryout with the WWE back in 90, you said you got to do commentary with Lord Alfred Hayes. Any right. chance you remember what matches you did commentary on? No, uh, <laughs> absolutely not. I probably uh, didn't remember it 10 minutes after I left Stanford because I was so nervous and excited and overwhelmed that, I, I, I no, I probably wouldn't have remembered if you asked me that question on my way to the car leaving the building. Mike Kling, 7144, says, if the shoe was on the other foot and WCW won the war, would you have made Vince the GM of Nitro? That could have been fun. Can you imagine Vince strutting to the ring? I mean, I never, I, I've never given that. Well, actually, the only time I ever gave that any thought was the first time I ever talked to Vince, aside from my audition in 1990. When Vince called me to offer me a job back in 2002 or whatever year it was, 2001, yeah. I can't remember. The very first thing that Vince said to me was, Hurt, I'd like to believe things would have been different. That you would have at least offered me a job. Something to that effect. I went, wow, never thought of that before. I wonder what that would have been like. And I haven't thought about it since. I don't know if it would have made sense. Sure, sure. If Vince was, I don't know that Vince would have been interested in that opportunity. Like well, I let's was. Just, let's yeah. just pretend he was for a minute. Let's just pretend that you're going to make Vince the GM of Nitro. How long until you make him, or you 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 have him? You request that he make out with your wife Laurie and your daughter Montana. Yeah, I don't think that would happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, that what weird, isn't that weird to think about in hindsight like once upon a time your biggest rival you went to work for him and then he said all right first order of business go put your tongue down my wife's throat god <laughs> hold on hold on <laughs> we lost uh, it <laughs> i had to, i had to choke on that one yeah that was weird it was still every time I tell that story, it's a it's a winner. Anytime I'm in front of a live crowd and I try to explain that story in Vince's direction, that's the funny part. The funny part isn't so much the you know, it's acting, right? It's no different. It, TVs, movies, you see that kind of silly shit all the time. But it was the direction that made it so bizarre. I want you to grab her, bring her into you, rush yourself. I was like, dude. Christ, dude, you've given this a little too much thought. <laughs> That's a, that was the weird part. Let's do a fun one here. Rich Piana, 5862 says in his time at WCW, who was the funniest wrestler backstage? That's a fun one. Who was funny back in the day? Brad Armstrong was always laughing. Of, he was always fun. Was Dean on the list? I hear he had a great Dean, Dean, Dean had a very dry sense of humor. So he, he was one of Dean <laughs> Dean was one of those guys that, you know, he'd say something really funny and you'd 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 think about it for a second, you'd walk away, and then five minutes later you'd bust out laughing. <laughs> that, that was Dean. You know, I, I don't, Brad Armstrong was a guy that always just for whatever reason, it's like every time I walked by him, he was cutting up, making other people laugh. Um, he's the only one that I can really think back on that was funny kind of consistently. Bagwell was funny. Bagwell would tell stories 
And it was more often than not, it was self-deprecating, which I know doesn't sound like Bagwell, right? Because he's, you know, if you don't know him or you didn't know him back then, you would think he was just, you know, a narcissist. But the opposite was true. He he made a lot of fun of himself in some respects. You know who else is really funny to this day? Is Ernest Miller. Oh, yeah. Ernest Miller is a hoot. No doubt. He's got a great sense of humor. He's a great storyteller. By the way, he's got a podcast. I encourage people to go out and listen to it. But Ernest Miller would, he all, to this day, makes me laugh. I love being around Ernest Miller because he just makes me laugh. Puts me in a good mood. Uh, at Jason six, six, six King, what a handle that is says brighter future, Eric MJF or Braun breaker. Well, that's a tough one. You know, we haven't seen much MJF lately, right? Is he hurt? What's the deal yeah. with him? Yeah, he's hurt. He How had bad? Surgery. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I know he's trying to rehab right now, but, uh, it was pretty serious. What was the injury? Do you know? Shoulder, I believe. Oh, those, those suck from what I've heard. Everybody that I've I've known, I have a lot of friends that have had knee replacements, hip replacements, multiple knee replacements, and probably hip replacements. Mm-hmm. Back surgeries, Hulk has talked about his back surgeries, 17 of them, 18 of them, 40 of them, whatever he's had. But even Hulk said the worst of all the surgery, and I think Hulk, I've never known anybody that have as, half as many surgeries as Hulk Hogan has. Hulk said the absolute worst surgery he's ever had was a shoulder surgery. And I think Bruce is probably right. Bruce Pritchard is probably right there with him on that opinion. He's had that- Bruce had both done and, wow. and, and, and punk's got one going right now. And MJF man in a business where everybody's trying to pin shoulders to the mat. They're all well. Right. the good thing about MJF is he's young. You yeah. Know? I mean, he's very, very young. Your body heals. You can rehab. You know, it just all works better when it comes to rehabbing and, and healing up the younger you are. You know, Punk's in his 40s. That becomes a little more challenging. Your body just doesn't respond the same. Um, given that piece of information, I would, if I had to put money by making an investment on somebody's future, I'd go to Braun just because of that injury because that's a significant one. Fade into obscurity says, would you ever challenge Dave Meltzer to a fight like you did Vince McMahon in the nineties? That could be fun for charity. Would you do something like that, Eric? Hell yeah. I can still go. I can't go. I can't go a lot. I can't go long, but it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day. You know, I spent seven years studying martial arts. And 80% of everything that I learned and trained in and practiced diligently is completely not usable in a self-defense situation. It's just not. But that 20% is. And the 80%, all of that training, the fundamentals, the footwork, the balance, all the shit that we used to hate doing over and over and over again is essentially creating muscle memory. I mean, you get to the point where it is like riding a bike for certain things. And of all of the techniques I used and competed with and very effectively at, at, at one point in my martial arts career, I was actually pretty damn good at kicking people's ass competitively. But only about 10, 15, maybe 20% of that would actually be usable in a self-defense situation in a, in a real, honest, practical way. Of that 20%, I probably got about 12. So I'd be happy to go. Absolutely happy to go. That'd be fun. Well, you know, you said you couldn't go long. If you want to go long, can we recommend trying our friends at Blue Chew? going to have you feeling like you can still go blue cheese a unique online service that delivers to you the same active ingredients as viagra cialis and levitra but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost take them anytime day or night so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises the process couldn't be simpler you'll sign up at bluechew.com you'll consult with one of their licensed medical providers and once you're approved you'll receive your prescription within days and here's the best part 
man, it's all done online. That's right. That means you don't have to go to the doctor's office. You don't have to have any uncomfortable or awkward conversations. And there's no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue juice tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. So discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And boy, do we have a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code 83 weeks at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is 83 weeks, and you'll receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. I've got another question for Eric here, and this one's about Bret Hart. Matthew Hutchinson, 1167 says, I noticed you and Bret Hart are coming to Victoria, Australia next month. Will you go out of your way to talk and engage with the hitman? As a big 83 weeks and Bret Hart fan, it would be great if this feud could end and you two could end up being friends again. So before I let Eric answer, I want to remind everybody that's right. I'm going to be on stage with Bret Hart for the very first time. And it's happening in Ballarat, Victoria, Australia, April 11th through April 14th. And it won't just be me in the building. Eric Bischoff will be there too. Bracelets are on sale now. And if you pick up a bracelet, that means you get access to all events. And when I say all events, I don't just mean our panels. I mean, there's not one, but two wrestling shows. Mickey James is putting together an all ladies show called H E R. And there's another show called Bret Hart's Australian Stampede, a super card of wrestlers from all over the world. Now, my panel with Bret will be called Hitman, an evening with Bret Hart, where we will take some of your questions, but we'll also be discussing the 30th anniversary of his WrestleMania 10 match with Owen Hart. Plus, like with every star cast, meet and, gre- meet and greets galore, meet all your favorites, see the matches, watch the shows. One bracelet gets you access to it all at starcast.com. That's S S T A R R C A S T dot com. Starcast.com. S T A R R C A S T dot com. Eric, what do you think of the question? Are you going to try to bury the hatchet with Bret Hart? He's going to be there. I'm going to be there. You're going to be there. It's going to be contentious. Or are you guys going to be pals? Well, I, I, I don't know what <laughs> I can't speak for Brett, but I've got no, honestly, I've got no ill will towards Brett. I could, I could easily sit down and have a beer with Brett. I'm, it's not like I'm harboring any grudges or ill will, or he's got his view of the world. I got mine. We differ, but that's okay. You and I differ on a lot of shit. So sure. it doesn't matter. It's not like I'm going to be angry. Uh, I'd, I'd love to sit down and have, have a steak with Brett. I'm, I'm cool with it. Join us. Starcast.com Ballarat, Victoria, Australia, April 11th through April 14th. We're inside of a month now. It's going to be fun. Uh, we've got a, a bunch of different questions, but one about your hair is you used to brag that you had the best hair in the business and it's still fighting its way back. Your, your hair is the ultimate underdog. Your hair loves a comeback story. Your hair endeavors to persevere as you would say. Ah, I love that. And, and, and here's a great question from our Gook the butcher. I've been going gray since my mid twenties and I've been dying my hair regularly for years now at 38 years old. I'm pretty much over it. And I'm ready to succumb to the gray. When did Eric finally decide to hang up the die? And how liberating was it once he did? One of the greatest decisions I've made in my television career was not dyeing my hair. And I too started in my mid 20s, I think 26, 27, 28, somewhere in there. And <laughs> this is a funny story. So, you know, my because my hair was black, you know, it was looked the same as I did when I dyed it, it was the same shade of black. It's not like I was light brown or anything like that. It was black, black hair. But the first time I noticed that I had a gray hair, I thought I didn't think it was a gray hair. I thought it was a dead hair. And I went to Lori and I said, Hi, look, look, one of my hairs died. She said, What? I said, No, my it's a dead hair. Here, I'm just gonna pull it out because it's dead. I'm not thinking I'm turning gray. I just think I had one hair that died out of the oh, millions right. of hair follicles in my head. I've only got one that died. Maybe it wasn't getting nutritious. Maybe, maybe I hit my head with something and it killed the root. I don't know. It's a dead hair. Pulled it up. A couple of weeks later, I go, fuck, I got three dead hairs. What's up with my hairs dying? 
So I pulled out the three dead hairs. And eventually, over a period of a couple of months, I mean, I'm plucking hairs on my head of regular faces. And Lori says, says, Eric, they're not dead. They're gray. What? <laughs> no. What? No, your hair's turning gray. No, it's not. It's just a couple dead hairs. I got to eat better. Maybe there's some nutrition. I'm not getting. No, Eric, your hair's turning gray. And once I accepted it, I kind of got over the initial shock of it all because I was in my 20s. And then I said, oh, well, I'll just dye it. Now, the majority of my hair was black, so it wasn't a big deal. But as time went on, now I'm dyeing my hair because by this time, it's 1987. Now, I'm on television at this time. Right. And I had been dying it before that. But but now I'm on television, 1987, 1988. Now my hair is, you know, I'm, I'm dying it on a regular basis. And over a period of time, I didn't realize how gray my hair was getting. It's getting grayer and grayer and grayer, but I don't really notice it because I'm dying it every two weeks or three weeks, whatever it was. Until one point, I think it was in WCW, like Nitro era, because I let my hair grow longer before I was. You know, when I was just doing announcing and play by play and color, I kept my hair short, looked like a you know sportscaster wannabe kind of thing, weatherman. <laughs> you look like a weatherman is what I look like. But as I, you know, the character, you know, the, the Eric Bischoff heel character, I sort of let my hair grow, and my hair was very thick and heavy and straight, of course. So as my hair is growing, now I'm seeing this silver streak down the middle where my hair parted. I look like Pepe Le Pew, the cartoon skunk. Oh wow. But that's, and I said, well, fuck, now I got to dye my hair every like eight days because my hair grows fast or grew fast. And I got to the point where I went, you know, I, I got to quit doing this. I was just tired of it. I was tired of getting my hair. I call it painted. It's like every two weeks, I got to go get my hair painted. I hated it. And that's when I came up with the idea. I think, it was, didn't Ric Flair shave my head first? Yeah, I think so. I think it was Ric Flair. That whole idea was really about me going, fuck it. I'm going to get my head shaved. I'm going to embarrass myself on national television. Everybody's going to see that I have gray hair and I'm never going to have to dye it again. It was purely selfish. I wasn't doing it to get Rick over. That was a side benefit. Not that I needed to get Rick Flair over. Rick Flair was already over, but it was a nice little thing, you know, feather in Rick's cap, I guess, as a character. But that wasn't the reason I did it. I did it because I was so fucking tired of dyeing my hair that I wanted a reason to go out and get my head shaved in public so I never had to do it again. And I was so happy with that decision all the way up until I got a phone call in 2002 from Vince McMahon. Hey, pal, think about coming in, being a general manager. Cool, Vince, cool, can't wait, boom, I'm in. Day later, I called Steph because Stephanie was in charge from that point on after Vince and I talked. She's just, re if you got any questions, reach out to Stephanie. So a couple of days later, I called Stephanie. I said, hey, Stephanie, good to talk to you. We've never met, blah, 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 blah. Oh, hey, Eric, can't wait for you to come in. We're all so excited. I said, Stephanie, just out of curiosity, you know, what are you thinking? You know, my hair's gray now, silver. You know, it was black back in the NWO thing. I said, it's up to you, Stephanie, because, you know, I work for you now. What would you prefer? And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, 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 don't dye your hair. And she goes, oh, no, dye it black. Oh, fuck. Fuck. Okay. You've given me 350,000 reasons a year to dye my hair black. I'll dye my hair black. Good to go. But I think you should embrace the gray. Embrace the, first of all, chicks kind of dig it. I know it's it weird, sounds crazy. It? it sounds crazy. Especially if you got those 30 somethings out there that still have some lingering daddy issues. Holy crap it's unbelievable so don't be afraid of the gray okie dokie little pro tip from eric there maybe <laughs> have some blue chew too and uh like gray will fool them uh ting heat says how do you feel about logan paul's run so far personally i feel like he is a natural for this and he's right where he belongs eventually i'd love to see him as the wwe champion him carrying that championship would be huge for the brand and business in general. Have you been keeping up with Logan Paul? What do you think of what he's been doing lately? I mean, a, a little bit. I'm not following closely, but I think he's a machine. He's a money making machine. Um, I, I think he, yeah, I mean, he was born for the business. I think he's a fucking wrestling version of a test tube baby. 
He's like perfect for the business. I mean, he's, he, he, he brought a massive audience with him and the audience that pre-existed prior to his arrival love him and have accepted him because of his performances, which was like the biggest thing. Wrestling fans, believe me, <laughs> we all kind of know this in different ways at different levels, but wrestling fans are demanding. I mean, if you try to shove something down their throat, they're not only going to gag it up, they're going to gag it up all over you. They do not like things being forced upon them. You have to earn the respect of the wrestling audience over time, and it takes time. The newer you are, the tougher it is. Because they, I think the wrestling fan in general, obviously we're talking about generalities here, but are very resistant to anything new. But once they find something new and it earns it, he, she earns their respect, whether it's a storyline or a talent or music or whatever it is, once they accept you, you're kind of good for you're good for a long time if you work at it. And I think Logan Paul, because he was such an amazing performer and over delivered, much like Bad Bunny did. But Logan came back and kept coming back and is now back full time, or at least it appears to be. I think he's earned so much respect. And like earlier, we were talking about goodwill. That's what I'm talking about the goodwill of the wrestling audience. And he's earned it, and he's enjoying it, and I think he fits into the industry like he was bred for it. Let's do three more, and then we'll start to wind it down. Uh, we've got an interesting question here from Corey Pritchard, 9915. He says, watching WrestleMania 38 back, it seems like Vince knew he didn't have much longer before everything came out. One more Steve Austin match. One more match for him going against McAfee while trying to boost his next project, Austin Theory. One more stunner. Finally putting the Undertaker in the Hall of Fame and inducting him himself. And of course, his two biggest projects, Rock, I'm sorry, Brock and Roman headlining. WrestleMania 38 seems like it was the real conclusion of the McMahon era, and we just didn't know it yet. What are your thoughts? It's really interesting, isn't it? It is. I, I didn't think of it, obviously, at that point. But looking back, it's hard not to it's hard not to come close to that conclusion, whether you actually get there or not, whether he actually knew this was all on the horizon or not. Only Vince McMahon knows that and probably Jerry McDivitt. But it sure seems that way, doesn't it? If it's if it wasn't that way, if Vince didn't know and maybe wasn't feeling like this could be his last one, it was produced and written as if he did. It's, it's an interesting observation. Could be true. Could be true indeed. Uh, let's do a question here from Creating Heat. Do you think your good buddy Bruce Pritchard deserves a spot in the WWE Hall of Fame? I know most everyone is familiar with his work as Brother Love, but maybe his overall contributions to the business doesn't get highlighted or talked about nearly enough. What say you? Thousand percent. Thousand percent. And to me, that's everybody looks at the Hall of Fame differently, as they should, as they have a right to. I I kind of regarded as a representation of one's contribution either as a talent or as a celebrity you know celebrities make contributions to the industry they bring it up to to a different level in some cases and they're a part of that and you go back to you know Cindy Lauper and you know Muhammad Ali early on and and some of the uh, the the football players that were, that were part of it escapes me right now. I'm sorry. I'm sometimes shitty with names, but so many of the big celebrities that, that have been part of WrestleMania that made WrestleMania more of a mainstream property early on when wrestling was still kind of transitioning out of the small venues, arenas, smoke filled studio kind of environment that, that 
professional wrestling had always been stigmatized with, or, or actually was for such a long period of time. Then you get into the WrestleMania era and the cable television and all of the production values and the, the celebrity Liberace and all these people that Vince brought in that seemingly had no connection at all to professional wrestling, but they elevated the business. And I think anytime you've got anybody who's had an opportunity to contribute to elevate the quality of the business, then I think that's that's somebody who's Hall of Fame worthy. And I don't know how anybody can look at Bruce's body of work and experience in the industry and the things that he's had his fingerprints all over, some of the critical decisions that he was instrumental in making or supporting, or in some cases fighting, that ultimately had an impact on the growth of the industry because it's the growth of the industry that I think we should celebrate. And I don't know how you can look at Bruce Pritchard and, and it's a lot of people don't know. I mean, if you don't know some of the things that Vince was, or Bruce was involved in and, and the decisions that he made and the experiences that he gained working for Paul Bosch back in Texas as a kid, fuck, what was he? 15, 14, barely pubescent 12, at that point 12, in time, 12. 12, fuck. He didn't even have a hair on his chin. But he's learning the wrestling industry and that 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 experience, that perspective helped Bruce contribute to the growth of the business. And for that reason, forget about the brother love gimmick. That was entertaining as hell, and almost everybody remembers it. That's over, you know, 40 years old. Not because he was the greatest talent in the world, but because of what he's contributed to the growth of the business. Absolutely. Fucking lootly. Well said. Totally agree. Uh, let's do uh, one more here. And we got, man, we got so many. We're going to have to do another one of these. Maybe we'll do one exclusively for 83weeks.com. Uh, oh, you know what? We got a live studio audience. Let's go grab one of those before we wind things down here. Man, appreciate the question, Carl Hayes, and certainly Bobby. That was a great question as well. I'm going to go with Bryant's, though. Bryant says, a show like Lucha Underground I thought was way ahead of its time. Could a show like that work today, and would Eric be interested in doing a wrestling show like that? You know, Eric, that was uh, really designed for streaming, or so it felt. It was not a live event. It was episodic, and it was um what was the the word we used during the pandemic when everything was shut down cinematic we had cinematic matches and storytelling do you think we might see something like that with with wwe easing in the netflix could that be the next big thing yeah I, I i do because look it's characters in its story and maybe even more so today than back when lucha underground premiered because I think people's perspective of professional wrestling is broader and, and deeper than it was back then. I think people would be more willing to accept it and find it interesting and entertaining. I don't know that the Lucha aspect of it, because that's kind of hard for the American audience to relate to hardcore wrestling audience, of course, but we're talking about mainstream. You know, if you want to get, I think he just means the style of the show, not necessarily the style of the in ring, but the, the style of the show. Yes, because it's just storytelling, of course. Yeah. It's just storytelling. And I think there's a way. I, I would be surprised if it doesn't happen sometime in the next couple of years, to be honest. Man, I know I said we were doing one more, but I got to do another one. And I, I thought we were moving on from AW Talk. It was just getting a little too negative for me. But Coach Keith has a great question. And I know you and I know the answer. Uh, what would get AEW kicked off of Warner brothers slash discovery low ratings because AEW is getting better ratings than the NBA and NHL that they also broadcast. So the idea here is, you know, I know you're saying, well, their ratings are down and who knows if they're getting renewed and blah, blah, blah. He brings up a good point. They do often beat some of their other live sports programming, but that's not the full story. Is it Eric? It's not the story at all has nothing to do with the story. If you're Dave Meltzer, it does. But if you're in the television industry and you recognize that one ratings point in an NHL game is worth $10 and one ratings point in AEW is worth 47 cents, you realize that ratings in and of themselves 
are only one measurement of success. It's the revenue, as I talked about earlier, that's associated with that rating. And that's the issue. And it always has been. It was the issue with Fox and SmackDown, wasn't it? It wasn't that the show wasn't getting great ratings. It was the number one show on network television on Friday nights. Forget about cable. It was the number one show consistently on network television. But it could Fox advertising executives, people that were selling advertising within a Fox network, could not sell SmackDown at a high enough rate. They're called CPMs, cost per thousands. They could not sell that advertising at a high enough CPM to get a return on the investment that they were making in the form of a license fee. That's the business of the wrestling business, the business of the television business, but in this case, specifically the wrestling industry. So while people like Dave Meltzer, who have never been in the television business, and despite the fact that they say they study the wrestling business or they study the television business, fail to make the connection between ratings and revenue, that's been the problem with professional wrestling historically. It was the problem with professional wrestling, as I just outlined, with Fox and SmackDown. And it, I'm guessing, I'm not going to guess, I'll go out on a limb. It's absolutely 100% of the problem with AEW and Warner Brothers. One of the reasons I keep banging the fucking drum, hoping that just by pure osmosis and maybe death by a thousand cuts, somebody named Tony Khan will listen when it comes to blood and excessive violence, just so you get a this is awesome chant. Because those are the things that will prevent AEW from enjoying whatever benefit they could potentially enjoy from whatever ratings growth they might get someday. That's the issue. So it's not what the ratings are. It's what the revenue that those gen those ratings can generate. That's what matters. And my guess, it's just a guess. I'm not there. I don't have books in front of me. My guess is that even though the, AEW ratings are could compare favorably to some NBA games or probably almost always NHL because nobody watches that shit anyway. But the amount of revenue that those ratings generate from a traditional legitimate sports league are different than the ratings that are going to be generated by general entertainment, which wrestling is. It's not a sport. You can say it all you want. You can, pres you can present it as a sports property if you choose. It's a scripted form of entertainment. It's general entertainment. And those ratings in that form of general entertainment probably are not generating the type of revenue that a rerun would. It's just a fact. Well, it is a fact that we are out of time now. We are going to be going live sooner rather than later on 83weeks.com. And this is what you can expect. You get to ask your question live to Eric Bischoff. We're going to be going live whenever there's major news or major events. So far, we've circled the go-home week for WrestleMania and, of course, WrestleMania night one and two. We want you to make plans to join us and uh, join the Bischoff World Order we actually have a membership option with some special perks there for you to check out as well. But it's absolutely free to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications bell. Doesn't cost anything to come hang. So come join us, 83weeks.com. By the way, if you're looking to get the word out about your business and you're targeting men that are 25 to 54, no better place to advertise than right here at advertisewitheric.com. And uh, if you've got a question for next week's show, don't forget, you can ask it on social at 83 weeks on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. But the easiest, best place to ask the question is our YouTube, 83weeks.com. We've got some new swag available for you over at boxofgimmicks.com. And we've mentioned it before, but we've got an affiliate sponsorship with Fanatics. And you can get all your favorite swag for WWE right now when you support the show. It's a big deal. And we want you to check it out. If you haven't already, just scan the UR code or the uh, QR code. My apologies. That's up on your screen right now. We've got a link in the description as well. Uh, but dude, 
this idea that you can go get NWO merch to this day and you never actually officially got royalties off of that. But now if they buy NWO merch from fanatics and they use our special link, dude, how about that? I, we, we, we found a way for you to get paid for your NWO shit. And absolutely. And if you're listening to the show, do not, do not, do not go to WWE.com. Do not purchase this stuff on the WWE website. Purchase yeah. it right here, fanatics, because yours truly will get a taste. It's a little tiny taste, just a small fraction of a taste, but it's a taste. That's all that matters. It is a taste. We greatly appreciate all of your support, but seriously, if you go support our site and man, it's so easy. It's just an affiliate partnership with fanatics. It's shop wrestling merch.com. Not only can you grab NWO hats and NWO hoodies and NWO t-shirts, but you can get all kinds of other stuff. There's more than like a hundred NWO items. And when you pick one up at shop wrestling merch.com, finally, for the first time ever, Eric gets a little bit of a royalty. So. Hey, we found a workaround. And it makes it feel more original. I mean, I was the one, uh, you know, fairness, Larry Zabisco deserves a little bit of a taste too, because he came up with the NWO thing before I did. But in reality, I created that shit. It was, you know, that, I mean, so now the NWO merch that you get from fanatics is more like original. It's not bootleg. It's not like the the the, the other stuff is a ripoff. This is the original thing. This is the original NWO because it's coming from, well, me shop wrestling merch.com is where you can hook it up and if you've got questions we'll try to have answers we're going live on 83 weeks.com sooner rather than later go hit that subscribe button turn on the notifications bell and we'll be back next week with another edition of 83 weeks with eric bischoff